Well, Nicole and I both have Vermont backgrounds. Uh, I lived in Vermont for 13 years. Uh, I worked at Washington uh, County Mental Health. Uh, before that, I, I taught in Derby Line uh, at Derby Elementary School, and uh, I lived in Burlington and worked for uh, Howard Community Services. Back then it was Howard uh, Community Mental Health. Uh, and I'm always glad to be uh, back in Vermont, even if it's only virtually this time. Nicole? Hello, my name is Nicola Blank. I live in Silver Spring, Maryland. I wear a gazillion hats. And then most of you, some of you probably know me from my days at Green Mountain Self Advocates. Uh, I'm the author of the book, Disability Employment Policy 101, and the author of the toolkit, Why Employment Matters. Uh, I also serve as a self advocate advisor for TASH's Disability Employment Grant, in addition to doing a bunch of other consulting projects as I bounce around. Okay, can everybody see the, the title page of the, our uh, presentation? Yes, it looks good. Okay. Now you can answer this in, in the chat if you'd like, um, just real quickly. If someone says the word autism, what do you think? What are some words that come to mind? Don't be shy. Social and communication challenges. Communication challenges, see neurodivergence, intelligence, range, discovery, unique individual, spectrum, social difficulties and anxiety, someone who can teach us, feeling it falling under a spectrum, narrow focus, spectrum, social communication, anxiety, hyper focus, sensory differences. Okay, great. Um, it's interesting. I think it's uh, um, the list that you came up with is very different than what we might have seen 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I, I think there, there seemed to be a lot of focus on uh, sensory issues. There was uh, a focus on people. A lot of people mentioned that it was a spectrum. I think uh, something we'll talk about today that everyone from with autism is is very different. Uh, someone mentioned Stephen Shore in his quote, and we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, yeah, it's just it was it's interesting to see what you came up with and how different it was from a year a few years ago. I think um, it's an indication that our understanding of uh, autism is evolving all the time. Nicole? Words of wisdom for the day. See the able, not the label. Amazingly unique, totally interesting, sometimes mysterious. If you think that's a good description of you? <laughs> yeah, it's a term I like. I, the term I got from Max Barrows, Three Mountains of Advocates. <laughs> Especially, you know, coming from the age where, oh, autism's a disease, autism's cancer, autism's a boy thing. Not a girl thing. The thing that takes it a normal child away in the night. Okay. Instead, you're emphasizing some of the positive mm -hmm. characters. Yep. Great. Let me just review quickly the definition of autism in the DSM-5, persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. And that's across multiple contexts. Restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities, which is something probably most of you are familiar with. Uh, but symptoms must be present in the early developmental period. Some characteristics of ASD, difficulty with social interaction, difficulty in using language effectively, repetitive or stereotypical speech, um, stereotyped repetitive motor activities, 
uh, people on the autism spectrum uh, often refer to it uh, as stimming, um, motor planning difficulties. And we'll talk about more of these later and how they're, what it means in terms of supporting people uh, in employment. Rigid adherence to routines or rituals, apparent limited range of interests. Um, uh, I put a parent in there because we don't know for sure that a person has a limited range of interests. We know that they demonstrate that uh, in their actions, but we don't know, we can't know exactly what their interests are. Preoccupation with objects. Uh, we'll talk a lot about sensory issues, including oversensitivity, undersensitivity, high levels of anxiety. Uh, Nicole will be talking about that. Difficulty synchronizing movements with those of others. And that's something uh, rel relatively new in the, the literature, and we'll talk about it. Nicole? Difficulty interpreting emotions of others. GI issues, like gastrointestinal issues, like, you know, malabsorption, you know, dairy gluten intolerance, celiac disease, various IBDs, mental health issues, OCD, anxiety, PTSD, alexolemia, where you don't know like what you feel, suppressing emotions, holding it in, which, you know, often, <laughs> you know, can lead to physical issues down the line. Stephen Shore, if you've met one person with autism, you have met one person with autism. You know, no two people with autism are alike. For instance, I know somebody who lives in Stafford, Virginia, who, you know, who asks, you know, what would people often would term, you know, quote, more severe autism, or the word that I hate, low functioning. But you know, he's a neat freak, calm, cool, collected. Whereas, whereas me, you know, I have worse adaptive functioning. I'm somebody who has higher anxiety issues. Word about language. Many of us are taught to use people first language, people associated with the neurodiversity movement. You know, some, not all, reject people first language. Many people prefer to be called autistic because they consider autism not just something they have, something that is imposed on them or otherwise typical body, but rather a fundamental characteristic of who they are. And it's interesting, uh, Nicole, because what I remember one of the first times I met you, got, you know, the whole controversy with the word Asperger's, people saying Aspies, which, you know, not to, Cause controversy, but you know, the whole, you know, Hank Asperger being associated with Nazis, oh, one discovery over the last decade, which, I'm, which is why I'm glad they got rid of that term in DSM 5. I just like spectrum. Uh, somebody with autism, I don't want to be associated with Nazis in this day and age. It's interesting, Nicole. One of the first times I met you was at a conference and uh we were at a table with one of the founders of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And I'll never forget, it was one of the most interesting conversations I've ever heard was between you and that person. And uh, you were arguing people first language versus uh, using the, the term autistic. Anyway, pe people have various arguments for using uh -huh. both. Because, you know, when you get look at the non-disabled work, you know, getting them to see, okay, I'm a person first. You know, just like, you know, trying to push, get people to stop using the R word, the term special needs, which has become the new R word, special needs and fix pity. If we were really special, wouldn't everybody dream of, oh, I want my kid to be autistic. Yet that doesn't happen. Um, we know in terms of employment, we know that, uh, People, uh, here are uh, the employment rates from people with autism often have you had lower employment rates than their peers due to various barriers. 
like lack of long-term support for VR, which we'll get into. And, and people, Are you out? people on the autism spectrum tend to have a lower rate of employment than other people with disabilities. Good news for Vermont. Vermont uh, VR serves 85% of people with ASD. That was the second highest in the country. And this is from an article in 2018. It may be different now, but uh, um, I think every indication is that Vermont continues uh, to lead the country uh, in uh, employment supports for people on the spectrum. Sixty nine, sixty point nine percent of youth achieved employment, and that's well above average for the country. Uh, just in terms of people with IDD in general, we know Vermont uh, is way ahead of the rest of the country, or most of the country. Nicole. So we know that for those, those ASD who do work, about 80% work part-time. Most work for low wages. Jobs tend to be low status. They often end prematurely. They have difficulties with social interactions, supervisors. They tend to be underemployed. Their skill set does not match the job requirements, like customer service, for example. This is someone I know from Maine. Uh, she has a master's degree in education and counseling, but she almost didn't get into college because uh, she had difficulty with standardized tests. Uh, ultimately, she graduated though with, with a, a B average, uh, but uh, um, they had to make some exceptions for her to, to get into uh, school because of her difficulty with standardized tests. Uh, Xenia has a degree in political science, but her work has consisted of cleaning cat cages, janitorial work, office work, being a telemarketer, and working in a group home. Huh. Disability world, food, bills, flowers, filing are the four Fs of disability employment that we must move away from. Another example, Rosalind has a degree in accounting, but never worked as an accountant. She reported that she had take whatever job I could get, whatever was offered to me, usually menial jobs like entry level, computer, fast food. I think the longest I've ever held a job was for two years and even then I juggled a few times within the department. I don't even think I've worked longer than three months at any place, one place this past given year. And quite often, you know, VR is often, okay, you know, they'll place you in, when it comes to college, you will place it. Okay, this is the amount that's growing, not what you want to do, which is not person-centered. So we know there are a number of factors that affect uh, employment outcomes. And when we think of autism and we think about employment supports, we often think in terms of a person's social skills and their communication skills and their job skills. But we know that there's some other factors uh, you know, external to the person that uh, can often play a big factor. Household income is one of them. Why is it that people with higher incomes or from families with higher incomes are more likely to be employed than people with low income? Uh, and what can we do about that in the long run? How can we uh, create more equity there? Uh, race and ethnicity as well. Uh, if you're white, you're more than twice as likely, or about twice as likely to be working uh, as if you're black or Hispanic. Nicole? Factors affecting employment outcomes, family support. You know, studies show employment success for people with ASD is often the result of family advocacy and support. 
Families often help people navigate services and provide emotional support. Gender, women with ASD express greater concern than men about workplace stress, social interaction, social skill communication. Women are also disadvantaged by gender-related office expectations, especially around appearance. You know, family expectations play a big role more often than not in whether or not somebody will get a job leaving high school. We know effective agency support can really help a person uh, get a, a job, uh, workplace and employer engagement. And that's something we'll be talking about uh, throughout the day, but particularly in the afternoon. Um, uh, strategies that are used to support um, supervisor and coworkers understanding of ASD and the kind of accommodations that people need, such as a consistent schedule, um, knowing, helping people understand that people don't do well with unstructured time, uh, helping employers and coworkers understand that often you need to communicate very directly and concretely with people. So there's lots of things like that uh, that we can do uh, that can increase the likelihood of getting employed and staying employed. There are individual characteristics such as conversation ability. Um, we, it's clear that people who have good conversation skills um, uh, are much more likely to be working than those who don't. Uh, work experience, and we'll be talking about this and when we get to transition in the afternoon and talk, we'll talk a lot about the importance of that. Uh, we know that's true for people with disabilities in general, that those who work during high school are much more likely to be employed. In general, they have much better transition outcomes than people uh, who don't work. Technology, uh, we know that if people have access to various technologies, they're more likely to work. Uh, they're more likely to get a job and be successful on that job. Uh, and we know there are a bunch of individual characteristics, including independent living skills, graduating from high school, whether or not you have a diagnosis of an intellectual disability. If you have a diagnosis of ID, you're less likely to work. Communication skills, job skills, uh, and knowledge of occupational strengths and interests. The majority of studies on ASD uh, they uh, Scott and then their colleagues found uh, in a study um, um, focused on changing the characteristics of the person, teaching specific employment skills, teaching executive functioning, and we'll talk more about that this afternoon, teaching uh, communication skills. So we have all these studies out there looking at autism and employment. Most of them are looking at how do we change the person? How do we fix the person? So that, they can, uh, that, so that they can be employed. Uh, those studies have largely ignored the contextual factors. And we looked earlier at some of the factors associated with uh, um, success for people on the spectrum. It includes things like family support, uh, which has nothing to do with the intrinsic characteristics of the individual. Um, and they conclude impairment-focused interventions are not sufficient in maintaining successful work-related outcomes for people on the autism spectrum. There was also a study done recently uh, that looked at um, one particular characteristic of individuals with autism, and that was communication. And they looked at communication uh, among people with autism, and they looked at communication between people uh, one person with autism and one without. Uh, and they found that people were much, people with autism are much more satisfied with their interaction with the person uh, with autism. Um, and they argued um, that um, we need to be thinking, because it, communication is, is a give and take kind of thing. Um, I mean, it's not the kind of thing, it, it is <laughs> give and take. Um, they argued that we need to begin thinking of autism as 
a relational uh, impairment as opposed to simply an individual impairment. So when we think about those lack of social skills, when we think about the lack of communication skills that may get in the way of people being employed, we also need to think about, you know, those things being, you know, two-way things, they're relationships. And uh, when we look at supporting people in the long run in employment, ensuring their success, we need to think about enhancing those relationships, not just fixing the person's ability to communicate. Another thing that's been associated, and we'll talk more about that this afternoon, uh, talk about some specific um, uh, curricula that can be used in the transition process uh, for young adults, that's self-determination. Um, and we know that's better, it's associated with a number of- The more of... self-determination you have, the more, the, high, the better rates of employment and the better outcomes in terms of independent living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what we find, is, well, I'm not sure how true it is uh, now or in Vermont, but uh, what I found in this study um, in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, or Maine and New Hampshire that I did, was that almost none of the students had any uh, goals, none of the transition age students in the study had any goals related to um, self-determination, which is unfortunate since we know it's just really uh, vital in attaining good outcomes. Whole question. Given what you know about ASD and what, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to people with ASD becoming employed or staying employed? And can, we let, people, can we let people make more than one choice on this? Say uh, their top three. Feel free to type in the chat. Can we get that poll question up? Audrey, are, are you available to pull, put that poll up? One moment, technical difficulties. Okay. Maybe we should go on. We've got a lot to cover today and we can come back to that when you're ready, Audrey. Will you let us know? Oh, there it is. Sorry about that, my apologies. The poll went away. Did the poll reappear? Yep. Great.
Okay. I thought the results would be for this poll would be really interesting. Um, I think it is. Um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that um, uh, in a Vermont crowd, we'd see the responses uh, that you've given. Um, the biggest one is employer knowledge of ASD. Uh, second is, um, communication skills. But third is employer coworker attitudes to ASD. Uh, and we have fourth public perception of ASD. Then down the line, lack of work related skills. That's very low. Limited social skills is low. Behavior issues is low. Um, interesting, because again, you know, as we mentioned before, if you look at the research on employment uh, uh, for people, uh, on the autism spectrum, um, all most of the interventions look at changing behavior, working with communication, teaching social skills, teaching work-related skills, those kinds of things. And don't focus on those larger issues such as public perception, uh, coworker attitudes towards ASD, employer knowledge of ASD, those kinds of things. So, okay, can we close that poll and go on? Any... Nicole, do you have any reaction to that poll? Not surprised. Okay. Can we share the results? Yeah. Okay. If we could close that poll, we'll move on. Can we close the poll? The poll appears closed from my end. Is it still up? It is from my screen. Mm -hmm. Is it up for others? No, I'm not seeing it anymore. Let me, okay. Okay. Now. Oh, Nicole, you're up. Yeah. Reasons given for work difficulties, poor job matches, inadequate employment supports, ableism, especially lack of talent from employers, coworkers, difficulty with social interaction, understanding the rules of the workplace, the hidden curriculum, difficulty with front end tasks such as interviews, job applications. Many of us are poor interviewers. You know, ableism is the discrimination of of in social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the fact that typical abilities appear superior. At its heart, ableism is rooted in the assumption that disabled people require fixing and defines people by their disability. Uh -huh. like one thing, you know, we've seen uh, this pandemic has exposed all the ableism that's been hidden for many years out in the open. Many of our government policies are ableist, like benefit cliffs. We know that the employment rate for those who have a co-diagnosis of intellectual disability is much we, wait, wait, are we on uh, reason, other reasons for? I'm sorry, Nicole. What? Slide 27, page 27. Reasons for work difficulties, lack of natural support. Okay. Yeah. Outside the workplace. I'm sorry, Nicole. Transportation, benefit cliffs, limited long-term VR services other than long-term employment supports. Book rehab does not provide job coaching, which many of us in the autism world need. Lack of flexibility on the part of an employer. 
service access by persons considered quote, high functioning. It's time to get rid of IQ limits. Yeah, and there are a lot of people around the country who have a diagnosis of autism who have trouble getting services, right? Because, uh -huh, uh, because they don't have intellectual disability. Yeah. You know, even autism without intellectual disabilities just does disabling. It just does impactful on a day-to-day -day basis. But we know people who do have a diagnosis, co-occurring diagnosis, uh, are much less likely to find work even though we've known for more than a decade that with the right support, uh, people can work in a variety of jobs, um, do a variety of tasks. And the capacities that a person brings to a job, whether it's job skills, communication, those aren't permanent and unchangeable characteristics. With the right support, uh, people can develop some of the skills that they need to be successful. Um, I don't know if any, I think some of you are probably familiar with Project Search. Um, it was a, a project uh, to uh, work with students um, who are youth who uh, were considered to have a significant impact from autism uh, to see if they could be competitively employed. They used a combination of supports that included social communication training, use of visual cues, behavior support, and self-regulation strategies. And over 70% over of those uh, obtain employment at or above uh, minimum wage. And many of those are people with limited communication skills, uh, often considered to have uh, an intellectual disability as well. And it's interesting because in the description of their program, they talk about these supports that are listed here. And those are really about changing the individual but I would argue that Project Search also really works um, at the larger environment, the contextual factors as well, because many of those people uh, are employ employed at medical centers uh, associated with universities. Um, and they've worked you know, very closely with those medical centers uh, uh, and the, the uh, people there to um, uh, create uh, a good working environment for people um, on the autism spectrum. Alan, this is Jenny. Could I just add a, a, a thought about that? Sure. Um, in Vermont, we do have the three medical centers that are uh, hosting Project Search and at Rutland Region oh. Medical yeah, and at Rutland Region Medical Center, I, one, one of the things I really love about it is that each year the new group of interns um, assist the HR department in their onboarding of all new employees at the hospital. And the, um, the interns actually run a session as part of the onboarding training of new employees, talking about differences in learning, you know, differences in, um, you know, how, how people approach their jobs and that type of thing, as well as what project search is. So that's been a huge cultural changer within the hospital there. Oh, that's great. I didn't realize that uh, uh, Project Search was in, uh, in, in Vermont. That's great. Yeah. And are they successfully employing people with more significant disabilities? People with would, limited communication, for example? Um, yes. Uh, each year, there's a number of students in each of the three um, sites that are experience, you know, life on the spectrum, if you will, they have autism and um, oftentimes um, anxiety and social uh, fears are at play. Um, and in terms of hiring people, I, I do, you know, it's hard to say what you would consider a significant disability, I guess, mm -hmm. what it is for mm -hmm. one person, it's not for the next, but um, these would be individuals that would have a hard time coming right out of the gate and going into a job without this one year experience, um, kind of in a real accepting uh, and accommodating, um, if you will, environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a, oh, lot yeah. a lot of growth. Yeah, I, I think the, the thing that you know really works well with that project is that uh, really two pronged approach where you're teaching skills, but also at the same time, you're really creating that very accepting environment and supportive environment. Um, and I think uh, 
uh, when we think pe about people across the spectrum, we need to be thinking about those, the combination of supports. Nicole. Social and communication difficulties often can mask abilities. It is a mistake to assume that what a person can do or communicate in a given situation is an indication of his or her abilities when appropriate supports are in place. For example, timing of communication can be difficult. Jay struggles sometimes to know when to address issues related to accommodations he needs. Value of employment for those with ASD. Improved emotional state, financial gain, greater social integration, improved self-esteem, greater independence. A friend of mine in Maine who unfortunately died in an accident several years ago, but um, I was talking to him about his work and he said, the thing I like most about work is the opportunity to interact with peers and be around friendly people. It's better than sitting around like a couch potato all day. And one of the things I like about that is that he emphasizes for him the importance of interacting with peers. And you know, if you think about our uh, conceptions of autism sometimes, you think of people as not wanting to really interact. And uh, you know, he was very clear that he did want to interact and he enjoyed that interaction. Reasons for hope. Demonstration that people with ASD, even those with significant challenges can be employed. Expanding knowledge base about effective employment support for people with ASD. Greater understanding of the way people experience autism. Growing public understanding and sensitivity. Research shows that effective planning and assessment can lead to good job matches. Potential of assistive technology. Growing Growing recognition that autism is not a vocational disorder. Autism is not a disease. It's not the equivalent of suffering through cancer, as some people out there like to say. When they talk about how burdensome it is. Predictors of good employment outcomes. Work experience while in high school. Development of self-determination skills. Active student family involvement and planning. Inclusion in regular classes being from higher income families, family expectations, and attitudes. You know, it's important to start early with high expectations for independent living, employment, community, inclusion. I'm going to talk about something that came up this morning. Uh, one of the things you indicated as an obstacle was um, uh, sensory issues. Um, we know that sensory factors such as so slow sensory registration, or you don't, uh, you're, you don't feel uh, sensory input quite as much as other people, or high sensitivity, you're overstimulated by certain things like uh, fluorescent light bulbs or um, certain sounds or noises. Those can be major stresses for people with ASD on the job. And we have to consider that as we're doing- Fire alarm as we're developing jobs for people. Yeah, what, Nicole? Fire alarms. Fire alarms, right. Thunder and lightning storms. Okay. You know, what tornadoes. About what tornadoes. about tornadoes? I, uh, tornadoes. I know uh, last week we just had a, we had a tornado warning down here. And somebody, uh, somebody who I know who's from the autism community who is also a parent, her daughter, she screamed when, as soon as, you know, she dragged her kid to the basement. Tornado warning. And Lily screams so loud. Stuff like that is very triggering. <laughs> Do you want to say something about those glasses that you're wearing, Nicole? Uh, these glasses here are blue light blocking glasses, which are something that everybody should be wearing nowadays. Uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, screen time and, you know, because negative so much screen time can affect sleep, especially in people with autism who often have insomnia and sleep issues. In addition, you know, all the screen time over the last two plus years is going to lead to an epidemic pandemic of nearsightedness among kids and adults needing new prescription glasses. They don't have them already. 
some of the sensory issues that we see and people are hypersensitive to sound, people are hypersensitive to sounds or touch or to smells or sights or pain. Sensitivity to light touch, people don't wanna to be touched. You know, it's interesting if you go into schools, you can often pick out the kids with autism because if they're at the end of the line for lunch or at the front of the line, often because they're trying to avoid that contact with people, that light touch can be really hard for them. Picky eating, car motion sickness, that's something they call uh-huh. car- Yes, so that's something, you know, and between me and my sister, we both, you know, have car sickness issues, like, you know, going on windy roads, like, you know, like paved roads in Vermont are the worst. <laughs> and when it comes to, you know, Vermont has more dirt roads than paved roads. Paved roads are the lesser evil. <laughs> And then of well, course, going on, driving on roads where you're not, you know, like turning a bunch, going around in the circles, going around in circles will also trigger car sickness. Like every time I go, you know, in a car, I'm always bowled down the window. The front seat is the best place to be in the car for people with autism. Other issues are claustrophobia, which you here doesn't have that in this pandemic universe. You know, being around crowds, like, you know, for instance, every time I you know, whenever I fly to like Vermont or elsewhere, you know, I always try to get the, I'm always get to the airport hour and a half or so before, you know, fly out before the crowds. Like for instance, this past November for Thanksgiving, I flew out Veterans Day and then I didn't fly back till the, you know, the Monday after the Thanksgiving weekend. And by doing that, you know, I avoided all the crowds, the craziness. And as the pandemic only makes, you know, claustrophobia and fear of crowds more intense. I have relatives also that are afraid of heights, afraid of, you know, that's another thing I'm afraid of. DC is the only city in America with no skyscrapers. So as somebody who's afraid of heights, I have even relatives here that, you know, when it comes to being in large crowds, you know, they won't get on a bus because they'll have a panic attack. So um, you already mentioned, Nicole, things like fire alarms, thunder and lightning, uh, difficulties with fluorescent lights, we showed that picture of Stephen Shore earlier. He was wearing a cap. He always wears a cap because it uh, shields him from uh, the overhead fluorescent lights that he might encounter. People have often have a need for deep pressure, so they like uh, may have a, a, a weighted vest or a weighted blanket, or may do thing, other things to get deep pressure. I know a lot of people who love uh, being in water because the, of the pressure it puts on them. Uh, vestibular inputs and movements that may affect balance also. Um, people often have difficulty sorting out sensory inputs, um, determining, you know, where is this information coming from? People with sensory issues. <laughs> experience anxiety, have difficulty self-regulating, have strong emotional responses, and have difficulty recognizing what emotions they are feeling. They have difficulty expressing emotions, what is bothering them. In other words, holding emotions in, suppressing, which gets at things like alexolemia and all that. Uncertainty is one of the biggest triggers of anxiety. You know, if anything, you know, the last two plus years of this pandemic has, you know, given the non-disabled world an idea of what it's like to be lived with autism, ADD, anxiety. It's the closest it's thing to giving, giving everyone else, you know, our diagnoses. It's interesting, Nicole, you mentioned that the other day when we were talking about that relationship yes. between uncertainty. You know, you know it shows you, you know, we have more in common. We hate uncertainty. We hate disruptive change, whether we're autistic or not. Well, I heard somebody on NPR, I think it was yesterday, uh, talking about all the anxiety that people are experiencing with COVID. And uh, one person equated anxiety with uncertainty. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, yeah, and climate change is only going to drive further anxiety. It's like living in an era of uncertainty. How to survive change we didn't ask for. And there's that, that's actually the title of a book written about the Great Recession, Nile Ain't in the River. So, how do people deal with sensory issues, Nicole? Mm, rocking, pacing, staring out the window, moving around a lot, screaming, kicking, especially at the dentist's office. Me, I'm the worst person to drill, 
you know, with pull a tooth out, fill a cavity. You need to fill it. And I'm the one right now, as I get older, I become the heart. I'm the most difficult to mount. I've had more than enough cavities. I had three wisdom teeth taken out at the beginning of this pandemic, including an emergency extraction in April 2020. Flapping hands, jumping, putting hands over ears like a, you know, fire alarm, thunder and lightning. You, you know, if I'm outside and I get caught in a thunderstorm, I will scream and curse up a ceiling. <laughs> and you will see me tense up if you're ever with me. Please get me a taxi. Let's get out of here, please. Leaving the environment, shutting down, being unable to perform tasks, aggression, you know, suppressing emotions, holding everything in. Especially, you know, when we get, you know, so much ableism and gaslighting, I even see it in my own family. Hypervigilance, you know, people withdraw, people leave environments, you know, hypervigilance is common. Especially people that have grown up with, you know, trauma, being unable to fit in. Like, you know, me, every time I cross the street, I always hold out my hands. Because, like, I've come, I had so many close calls where I've come, like, this close here to, you know, getting run over. So I just hold them out. Time out. Slow down. Eh, that's another autistic tendency. People may rely on peripheral vision. Looking at things may be over, looking directly at something, especially another person's eyes may be overwhelming. People may mix senses, something called synesthesia. Uh, some people have difficulty filtering out irrelevant stimuli, such as a ticking clock. Uh, I think of one woman I used to know in Vermont uh, who, you know, I'd be working with her and she would hear all sorts of things in the background that I was filtering out and she would repeat it. Uh, experience something called gravitational insecurity, uh, be unable to sort out or respond to internal states, uh, partly because they're unaware of, of uh, they're having trouble connecting to their own emotions and feelings. People often seek out certain kinds of uh, feedback and you see that when people are rocking, you know, when they get anxious, they're trying to provide some feedback uh, uh, to themselves. Maybe perhaps vestibular sense of balance, proprioceptive, where our body is in space. So a lot of people, people on the autism spectrum, in many cases are avoiding certain stimuli. In other cases, they're seeking them out and they may need to seek those things out, especially when they're anxious, especially when they're having a difficult time with something. So uh, vestibular and proprioceptive feedback can be organizing. Uh, it may be important to allow a person uh, to get feedback in a particular situation. I think of my friend, my late friend, Joey, who when he was at work, his supervisor, uh, when he was getting overwhelmed, would allow him to take a break where he'd go in another room and rock for a few minutes and then come back to work. Um, sometimes it may be helpful to, to necessary to help a first person find replacement uh, behaviors. And I think about an eight-year-old I knew in Vermont uh, many years ago, he's well into adulthood now, I'm sure. Um, when I went to visit him in his foster home, um, I was talking to his mother and I looked out the window and he was standing on top of my truck. Uh, he was later living in another foster home where um, he disappeared one day uh, it was a he was living in a three-story home uh, and he was on top of the roof walking on the peak of the roof um, and he's someone who I think was really seeking out some of that vestibular uh, proprioceptive input and he needed that um, you know, really quite quite a bit of anxiety speaking of anxiety though for the family he was living with when they saw him on top of the the roof Alan, this is Brian. There's a question uh, in the chat. Would you mind oh. giving an example of, of what uh, conditions that mixed senses may look like? Oh, sure. Um, sometimes uh, people will, um, we think they'll hear something, but they'll also see it as a color.
Sometimes and of course, jam. when it comes to seeking out sensory experiences, things like massage therapy, acupuncture, zero balancing, yeah. deal with, you know, yeah. stress, yeah. anxiety, tension, especially if your muscles are always tense. I'm, try I'm trying to think of sp some specific examples of, of synesthesia. Um, uh, again, you know, you might, uh, when you touch, you see something, you may experience it as tactile input. I mean, you really can, um, neurologically, I think you can mix almost uh, any two senses together and so have difficulty sorting out, you know, what, it, what information is coming in. Is that sensory information or is that visual information or auditory information or tactile information? Um, and I think, you know, it, just, it makes it difficult sometimes to respond in any, any given situation when you have to stop and think about, you know, what's really happen, happening here? What am I experiencing? Nicole, did you wanna do this slide? <sighs> no. Reality to an autistic person is a confusing, interacting mass of events, people, places, sounds, sights. There seem to be no clear boundaries, order of meaning to anything. A large part of my life is spent just trying to work out the pattern behind everything, set routine, times, rituals. I'll help to get order into an unbarely chaotic life. Uh, structure and predictability is a must. You know, we don't like surprises, like getting letters in the mail saying, oh, overpayment of 23000 from Social Security. You know, stuff like that, you know, storms happening, you know, all of a sudden noises, you know, certain things like, you know, like every time, like every time I see a siren, I always cover my eyes, you know, having, you know, that structure, routine, as much as possible is ideal. Leads right into the next slide. Some solutions. Good job matching. Work with the employer to modify the work area by clearing up clutter. Move desk workstation to a quieter location. Wear blue light blocking glasses. But in this day and age, health and Zoom fatigue, in addition to you know letting people you know turn off their videos, can also cut down on burnout in the era of pandemic universe. Replace fluorescent tubes. Wear sunglasses and other tinted glasses. Use headphones, earplugs. I sleep with earplugs everywhere I go. I'm not, not sensitive. Own office where you can close the door, which, you know, in the new normal, you know, moving away from cubicles to, you know, single offices, I think would be ideal. As we look at the post-pandemic new normal. Some solutions, use white noise machine, allow you know, sensory breaks, you know, people cannot sit for long periods of time, don't require eye contact, use dividers that block distracting stimuli, pair visual prompts with verbal ones, introduce persons slowly to new environments, learn new tasks in all required environments. In other words, don't teach something in, in a place that you're not gonna do it every day. Generalization of skill, Temple Grandin. Here is a slide with Temple Grandin talking about sensory issues and autism long before that was an issue. Quote, when a sound pathway is very sensitive, crowds and traffic can be scary. It can be hard to sleep because of all the little sounds like wind blocking outside or crickets chirping. It's not uncommon for people to autism to hear things that others won't hear ahead of time or smell certain things. Quote, then I think I hear something and I look around and sometimes I see a person's shape or hear a person's voice, but it is the same way I see a light bulb shining in a lamp or a clock ticking because voices and shapes and a ticking clock and light all seem the same. 
in Port Temple Grandin. And what's interesting, I find, um, you know, for when um, autism was first identified, uh, people identified sensory issues. And that was sort of, you know, people forgot about that. Um, and with people like Temple Grandin, particularly Temple Grandin, uh, who, you know, person who experiences autism, uh, who raised the issue of, um, uh, you know, sensory issues are really important here and really under, important in understanding. And now it's become generally recognized within the professional community that sensory issues are, are really a big issue. Um, sensory issues and arousal. Um, Sensory processing. Yeah, alertness, okay. hypervigilance, which also, you know, factors into things like insomnia and poor sleep issues and people with autism. Like, you know, me, if somebody, like, I'm the worst person to share a room with. If somebody's snoring, you know, I will not be able to sleep through the night. You know, if somebody has a light on, I will not be asleep. I'm like, turn off the light, you know, go do something out there. Like my sister Megan, she always takes forever to get ready for bed. I'm like, kid, come on, enough, park it. Okay, so yeah. you need to think about levels of arousal uh, when thinking about autism uh, and sensory issues. Um, best performance, whether we're talking about school, whether we're talking about a job, is related to an optimal arousal level. And Barry Prezan, if some of you are familiar with his work, has talked a lot about this. Um, all arousal and attention requires uh, stimulation sensory input and providing the support to people with autism, we need to create that right balance of sensory inputs uh, in any given situation. Uh, we need to address potential overload and we need to make sure that the person has the input they need to stay focused uh, on their job. Alan, this is Jenny, could I make a comment? Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know somebody who, when younger, um, had a really tough time with uh, bright sunlight when driving in a car, and it was always difficult to not to figure out how to get the keep the sunshine out of the car <laughs> when when driving, you know, across the state or whatever. Um, and then eventually, that person was able to um, become more desensitized to that. It just happened with age more than anything. So when mm -hmm. the person was in high school, it was a problem. The person's now in their 30s and it's no longer um, as much of a problem. The person can tolerate that, that now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I know another person who was working at Bed Bath & Beyond and had a hard time with the area that had the candles because of the scents. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably something that's really um, germane to a lot of us, you know, whether you have autism or not, we're inundated with scents all the time. But I think that it's concerning to me that the scents are now everywhere we go. There's all these really strong, pungent scents. And I don't know, Nicole, if you have anything to say about that, but it seems to be an increasing problem, I think. But... Yeah, well, you know, bright lights, you know, yeah, that too. Like every time I'm in the car, you know, I always put down the shades. Um, yeah, I think it does change over time, too. I think of someone I'm very close to who couldn't stand the smell of bananas. He couldn't be in the same room with a banana, in fact. Uh, yeah. Or changing you know, a diaper. Right. He, he, actually, he actually eats bananas now. But um, yeah. um, Or strong odors, you know, skunks, you know, or, you know, for anybody here who's a big sister, big brother, you know, changing a sibling's diaper. <laughs> Yeah, that's some overstimulation that we can all identify with, I think, Nicole, for most of us. So we're going to talk about how sensory issues can relate to anxiety. And uh, Nicole, Research do you want to... Shows, you know, there's high levels of anxiety and, you know, people with autism, panic attacks. For instance, March 13th, 2020, I suffered my first panic attack at the beginning of this pandemic. 
you know, heart pounding, all of a sudden sweating like I'm having hot flashes. I ended up going to the ER, physiological arousal, social anxiety, separation anxiety, anxiety around change, overreacting to stimuli, like, you know, like this whole pandemic in the beginning, it's like all the answers to be, you know, nobody's communicating the fact. And we just, you know, telling the truth of, okay, how is this COVID crap transmitted and whatnot? You know, increased reaction to sensory stimuli, fire alarms, you know, thunder and lightning. If you're with me in a thunder during lightning, you'll see me tense up, scream, and say, hurry up, please, let's get inside, get away. You do not want to get caught with me in a thunderstorm. So people have a physiological, when people start to get anxious, they may have a physiological response to this. And this is something... Uh, uh, overpayments, first- dealing with social security overpayments is a, another example. Uh, you know, things, that, especially nowadays, the social security op- op- offices open, I think you're going to see more issues with, you know, social security issuing overpayments to people due so to that's offices being closed. That's something that's caused a lot of anxiety for you, right, Nicole? Uh-huh. And, that and may, you-, you may see that problem with others. I won't be surprised if I'm not the only one in this current... And do you experience do you experience that anxiety physically? Both, yeah. Okay. And this is something my former uh, the person I presented with uh, last time, Jay Collins, last time we did this training in Vermont, um, he talked a lot about this. Is that um, you have that physiological response to the anxiety, and that physical response is something that can create even more anxiety for you. So when we think about anxiety, we often think about it as, you know, sort of this mental thing as opposed to a physical thing. It is a physical thing. And there is, we have these strong physiological responses. Um, And those Mm, responses- Pain can be a response to anxiety, insomnia. You know, GI issues are often triggered by anxiety, especially Mm. if you suppress your emotions and all that. And you have stigma around, okay, you know, afraid of, okay, if I tell someone what's on, so what are they going to think? And that whole, you know, ableist attitude too, the people say, oh, don't use your disability as a crutch. Some specific causes of anxiety, unanticipated change, unclear responsibilities, changes in personnel, support, job support, physical environment. Difficulty dealing with downtime, being overwhelmed by sight, sounds, too many people, cluttered environment, problems, fear of what happens, okay, fear of losing public benefits. What are some things that we might do to reduce anxiety on a job for people with ASD? Feel free to chime in. You asking people to answer in chat, Nicole? Yeah. Don't be shy. For example, massage therapy. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Having a little technical difficulties there for a moment, sorry. So somebody asked, repeat the question, please. And the question are, what are some things you could do at to work? Reduce anxiety. Yeah. People on, with ASD on the job. And one person wrote, modifying light sources, particularly to use using natural lighting versus fluorescent. Yeah. Structure, time schedule. Yeah. Sending out agenda meet, meetings well in advance. Yeah. Good job match based on level of arousal. Lessen the noise. Meet in a quiet office. Establish routines, regular schedules, accommodations like earplugs. Yeah.
Great ideas. Okay. Working with peer supports at job site to understand how to best communicate with the individual. Yeah, good point. We'll, we'll talk about that later and some things that can be done. Visual schedules to support transition. Yeah, that's something else we'll talk about later. Oh, sorry. Okay, so why don't we go on to the next slide. Autistic burnout, who here has heard of that term? <laughs> Just curious, feel free to write in chat if you've heard the term. Autistic burnout is a physical and mental fatigue, intense stress and reduced capacity to deal with the demands of daily living that comes from being severely overtaxed due to the strain of trying to meet demands that are out of sync with our needs. Trying to act so-called, quote, normal is a major cause of burnout. For a state of pervasive exhaustion, loss of function, increase in autistic traits and withdrawal from life that results from continuously expending more resources than one has, coping with activities and environments ill-suited to one's abilities and needs. In other words, autistic burnout is a result of being asked to continuously do more than one is capable of without sufficient means of recovery. Like for instance, you know, and people, you know, society after labels high functioning, you know, you know, you know, there's, you know, you know, they expect more and there's they're less, you know, sensitive than somebody with a more significant disability and less sympathy. Changing one's behavior and impulses to appear to look quote normal takes a high degree of neurological, cognitive and emotional demands. Masking is tiring, especially in girls. A state of pervasive exhaustion, loss of function, increase in autistic traits, withdrawal, like, you know, like for instance, you know, like me cleaning a house and, you know, doing stuff like that is exhausting. And there's one reason why I often have a maid clean. But I only have so much energy. Yet, when people often, ex our society, you know, expect more of us, and here are some signs of autism burnout, increased sensitivity to stimuli, exhaustion, social withdrawal, irritability, lack of motivation, difficulty, self-care, sleep issues, hiding true identity, you know, not being able to be yourself, inability to maintain social skills, GI issues, high energy before collapse, overwhelmed, short attention span, increased anxiety, loss of skills. And this can be especially prevalent when you have autism, anxiety, and ADHD, all three of those conditions at the same time. Nicole. Nicole. Oh, oh, sorry, there's a okay. question to expand on uh, why masking is more tiring for girls. Well, my, well, autism is often thought of, you know, huh, you know, coming back to my childhood, oh, a boy thing. Like I didn't get diagnosed, you know, with autism until I was 21, yet I've had labels of mild MR, number of learning disorder, math disorder. So why is it more difficult? And it's like, and it's like you know, and I think, you know, it's like, you know, the attitudes around women, you know, people expect more from social perspective. You know, people, you know, women often feel the need to, you know, okay, you know, cover up until their autism and they often, you know, compensate until demands become too socially demanding. Like me, I grew up as a sheltered life, you know, until I went to job for where, you know, people were, you know, you know, it was an abusive environment. People saying the N word. People saying we burn, we in a fire. Oh, the room smells like ass. It must be Nicole's skin disorder. And doing a bunch of other teasing, bullying. That was my first time outside of my parents' so-called protective shell. I never had babysitters growing up. My parents always one person works at night, one person works a day, and even with all the special ed therapies and all that, special Olympics. You know, I never really had much, you know, social exposure. You know, I didn't really do chores that much. Andy said, it seemed like coming out of the initial lockdown period of COVID, uh, employers had trouble seeing this burnout when folks have just needed more different supports to get back out in the world. They may have had prior to lockdown. 
Oh, yeah, like for instance, doing back to back Zoom. If you've ever been in where you do back to back to back Zoom meetings without a break in between, that's kind of one big trigger of burnout. It's like, you know, it's like, whereas when we meet in person, you know, okay, we have at least 10 minutes to breathe, if we're going from a policy meeting to a hill visit. Yeah. You have to take the metro, walk, and you can breathe in the fresh air and clear your head. I think, I think whereas in a virtual point. environment, it's back to back to back. And it's like, and, you know, employers have seen this as an excuse to make us work more than our typical nine to five. There's no boundaries nowadays. I think Andy's we need point to get back to I think Andy's point may have been that, um, and tell me if I'm wrong, um, is that employers were dealing with everybody having some stress coming back into the work environment uh, after COVID. And it may have been more difficult to see the kind of stress, the, the burnout that people on the autism might be experiencing, employees on the autism spectrum. Correct. And then, of course, you know, like, you know, so, you know, so much screen time can also cause headaches, which is where the blue light blocking glasses come into play. Yeah. Solutions do more by doing less. From new normal, if I were in charge, you know, let's go to a four day, 30 hour work. You know, give people that option, you know, go to a six hour work day choice between seven and a half, four days a week, or six hours, five days a week. Because let's be honest, are we really productive eight hours a day? No. If we're truly honest with ourselves, you know, get massage, acupuncture, cranial sacral therapy, zero balancing, you know, meeting with an EMDR therapist, nature therapy. I've done a bunch of hiking. Like I hiked, you know, almost two miles this past weekend, Sligo Creek Park. Reduce daily demands and expectations, time off, shorter work week, reduce workload, prioritize must-dos, you know, have a to-do list as the supervisor, give the person a to-do list where it says, okay, what's the most urgent and what's the least urgent? You know, make time for self-care, limit commitments, let go of more productive things on to-do lists. Jenny uh, posted, can you help us understand how to not cause people to have fatigue from talk meetings and processing in our meetings to discuss services, job search, et cetera? Do you have any, Kim responded, that's a balancing act. <laughs> Do you have any response, Nicole? Okay, so what's the question? Can you help us understand how to not cause people to have fatigue from talk meetings and processing in our meetings uh, to discuss services, job search, et cetera? Well, I think shorter, you know, shorter meeting times when you look at, you know, like, you know, our culture is so much, you know, our culture, the society is like, you know, live to work, not work to live, which is what we need to switch to. You know, we're in this, you know, live to work mentality. Whereas we switched work to live. If you look at cultures, and then of course, you know, we need to, you know, like, you know, we need to reinvent the wheel and use this crisis. Like, you know, one reason why we see people aren't going back to food filled and all these restaurants when you look at the worker shortages, one, we got long COVID, which is only going to lead to, you know, more people becoming disabled. And two, you know, you got the fact, you know, all the COVID risk and all that. It's also playing a role. Not everybody wanting to rush back to the so-called normal pre-COVID routine. I'm thinking about people on the autism spectrum and sitting in meetings and difficulties they may have. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, you know, the more meetings you have a day, you know, the more tiring it is. Yeah. Less is better. But I think some of the things we mentioned before, having a clear agenda we know uh -huh. have a clear problems. agenda, you know, don't put too much stuff on a meeting. Like how many times do you sit in, you know, a meeting where, you know, you put more, okay, than an hour's, find out you put more than an hour's worth. That quite often happens. And then of course, you know, people talk too fast, people ram through the agenda, you know, da, 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 get that, like time out, slow down. You know, people don't speak plain language coming from a policy perspective, nonprofit world. You know, let's, you know, let's, you know, this time, this punish, climate change punishment is a message, slow down and let's rethink our values and our lifestyle. Yeah. 
Andy talked about building in natural breaks. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, always have a break in meetings, you know, and like whether it be a face to face meeting, Zoom meeting, you know, and let's be honest, you know, sitting, you know, for long periods of time, you know, most people get how many of us squirm and whatnot. And how many of us are easily distracted only in this worst of like, you know, the ADD has gone up to COVID, the other side effect. So here's another slide. These are some things you came up with. Um, mm -hmm. Nicole. Now, essentials for managing people with ASD. Be calm, cool, collected. Offer positive reinforcement. Keep an open mind. Be flexible. Behavior is communication. Be direct. Set clear expectations. Criticize gently. Offer frequent breaks. Sensory friendly settings. Provide structure environment. Provide a mentor buddy. Offer natural supports if they don't have job coaching. You know, avoid being hard nosed when it comes to management styles. Like, for instance, you know, Karen Topper, you know, Kim Mushino, who's policy director at Autism Society, formerly, she used to work at ACD. You know, I did two intern slash fellowship for me. You know, she's somebody who's calm, cool, collecting no matter how chaotic the world may be, mellow. You know, Karen Topper, mellow, play to people's strengths. You know, management style is plays a big role in whether or not people will be successful. You know, hard-nosed personalities that aren't understanding of disability do not work. Like, you know, like for instance, you know, one of my first jobs at high school was in my high school days was, you know, retail bagging and getting carts. And I had this hard-nosed manager who was like, you know, oh, wanting perfection every time and oh, expecting me to, oh, say hello and greet every customer yet, oh, be the quote, perfect bagger. And it's like, it's not realistic. And at that time, you know, I didn't, you know, I never knew I was autistic. All I knew I was nonverbal learning disorder, which has similar traits to Asperger's syndrome, you know, and as a result of that experience, I ended up, you know, one day she was like so hard nosed, I ended up going home with a, a stomach ache, you know, crying, running to mother, it's Polly again, help. You know, situations like that, you want to avoid as much as possible. Alexis pointed out that uh, this is a list this is a list you came up with, Nicole. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, like to, to manage uh -huh. and many people with ASD, you know, do not get, you know, you know, HCBS services that they don't have intellectual disability. We got wait lists in states, our state system where you at and across the country where you have to be crisis. You know, 75% or so of people, you know, outside, you know, when you look at the autism DD world, don't get any services. It's friends, family that make up the difference. Quote of the day. Quote, Nicole. Basically, the higher functioning you are, the more others expect of you. And also, the more you push yourself. You have to be, you have an invisible disability. You look so-called normal, which what is normal? A dial on the washing machine. And you have no apparent physical differences. Quote, I believe that that lack of autism acceptance what causes masking and as a result led to autistic burnout for me from one person. You know, our society needs to stop putting, you know, severely disabled, mild, you know, like look at the data, people that are labeled, you know, high functioning have higher rates of anxiety, depression, mental health issues, poor adaptive functioning versus, you know, some people with, you know, more severe autism, like somebody I know, friend who I know in, you know, Virginia, you know, he's, you know, mellow, calm, like he's a neat freak. He's the exact opposite of me. <laughs> Autism in women. Girls are often hiding in plain sight due to less severe symptoms. Girls often mask, pass as a, as quote, normal until social demands become too much. Like my parents overprotecting me for so many years and then all of a sudden I, you know, you know, 20, 21 go off on my own job for and all of a sudden, okay, the real world's not very kind. You know, current criteria for autism favors boys, you know, autism, you know, when I first heard autism in my younger days, I thought of, okay, somebody banging their head against the wall, flapping, somebody unable to speak. You know, girls get diagnosed later. Girls often mask to hide social deficits due to societal pressure, greater executive functioning deficits, it's common to be misdiagnosed with ADD, learning disabled, nonverbal learning disorder, intellectual disability. Like in Vermont, I know over the years they've shown as, you know, learning disability goes down, autism goes up. 
greater sleep issues, emotional regulation is hard, higher rates of anxiety, depression, PTSD, suppression of autistic tendencies, appear naive, immature, as she is, quote, out of sync with the trends of social norms, socially weird. Yeah. Especially, you know, if you're like, in my case, I'm the oldest out of my siblings. And, you know, I, <laughs> I've ha often had issues where my siblings have looked at me as weird. I grew up with a brother saying the R word when he'd get mad at the video game. And yet people say, oh, it's, oh, it's only offensive if you're saying it at the person's face. Not if he's just, oh, saying it at the computer as I walk by. Appear naive or immature. Autism can look like anxiety. Fewer repetitive behaviors. Vows are biased towards men. And you know, there, there's one theory of autism that um, describes it uh, as um, extreme masculinity. And, you know, from that perspective, uh, many women may look, um, uh, many women on the spectrum. Um, it, it, some of the, the characteristics um, um, may make them stand out a little bit more. Okay, um, where are we in the schedule? Um, we're gonna take a break after sensory um, issues. Uh, can we take a five minute break? And we'll get back together and uh, talk about some other things uh, affecting uh, success and employment, individual characteristics, uh, specifically movement differences and motor planning. Okay. Sounds good. So five minute break. Yep. Cool.
Okay, are we ready to get started? I think we are. And Nicole, we can only see your forehead. <clears throat> uh, there was one point uh, made by Mel Hauser from All Brains Belong Vermont. I really like the name of that organization. Um, talking about how the DSM criteria are behavioral observations of dysregulation. People are more likely to get identified depending on how dysregulated they are. And often people have to reach autistic burnout and reach profound levels of dysregulation before they are identified. Good point. Could I ask, uh, are you an OT by any chance, Mal? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Your words made me think that uh, uh, um, it sounds like something an occupational therapist might say. An autistic physician, okay, interesting. Um, okay, uh, movement differences in motor planning. This is something that often gets neglected. It's really not part of the existing criteria. Um, uh, Many people have trouble putting together new sequences of movement in order to, direct, to execute goal-directed acts. Makes it difficult to learn new motor tasks or to perform previously learned tasks under new conditions or with slight variations. So we talk about difficulties with generalization. If you make a change in a task, a slight change in something, it can be very difficult if you change the environment. It can be very difficult for the person to perform those, that same motor task uh, that they were able to perform um, in another situation. When we talk about motor planning, we're talking about something that's very complex. And it's not just movement we're talking about. We're talking about um, the way we're in interpreting sensory information, the way we're processing sensory information, and how we're combining that in our brain, in our spinal cord, basal ganglia uh, of, of the brain, um, the, uh, uh, just all the information, like in picking up a cup of coffee, we have to look at where the cup of coffee is. We perceive that. We have to perceive where our body is, how our body is moving. Um, so movement and sensory, the way we move and the way we sense are uh, intimately connected. Um, we talk about praxis that allows for planning, organizing, execution of motor skills in order to accomplish a desired task. Um, it facilitates complete, complex task completion by allowing an individual to use and combine various motor skills. People who have dyspraxia, it tends to be a need associated with a need for control of clothes, of food, uh, to ensure success. Uh, stress and fatigue uh, can result as having to work harder to complete a task. People often have an appearance of low self-confidence, uh, hesitation, tentativeness. And I know in schools, uh, especially like in elementary school, um, kids who have dyspraxia have difficulty with motor planning, they tend to get picked on. Um, so, uh, I mean, that has a number of issues around that. Uh, people may need more repetition to learn new tasks, activities, and steps. They have difficulty transferring what they've learned. They have difficulty with generalization. And they have a tendency to rely on memorization of rules or strict adherence to particular routines. This is the way it's done. This is uh, the way another word, reading tasks. between the lines. I'm sorry, uh -huh. Nicole, what? Reading but things like reading between the lines can be difficult. You know, yeah. divide, you know, say what you mean, you know, be... You know, like don't use figures of speech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about communication. Okay, so I've got an activity for everybody. Those of you who are right-handed, I'd like you to put your right foot on the floor and move it in a clockwise circle on the floor. So if you, if you have a pen or a piece of paper around, please grab a pen or a pencil and start doing that. 
First, get your foot moving on the floor. If you're left-handed, move your left foot in a counterclockwise direction, okay? Get your pen and your paper ready. Keep that circle going. Now write your name. Okay, so what happened when you did that? <laughs> One part, Kate, you wrote, it's extremely difficult. It's not so easy. Foot, your foot slowed way down. Okay, anything else? Anybody's handwriting get bad? Remove the automation of writing the name. Yeah, that's a very, very automatic activity. You don't have to think much about it. Your foot started moving side to side. I started moving my foot up and down. My foot moved back and forth rather than clockwise. One person, why was that so, Why was that easy for me? Good question. You probably have uh, one extreme end of, uh, uh, in terms of um, praxis. My foot started to write my name too. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. That's good. Um, okay. Okay. So th the point is that, you know, you can take something that's very easy. As one of you said, it's very automatic. and can make it much more difficult to do by just changing the situation a little bit. And we have to think about that when we're asking people on the autism spectrum, to, when they're completing any motor task, when it's a new activity, or it's a slight change in the way they did things in the past, uh, it can make it much more difficult. It's like writing your name with your moving your, your uh, uh, foot in a circle. So some of the motor characteristics that we see in ASD, people have motor planning issues, uh, executing a particular movement for a particular purpose. People have problems with gait and posture, with balance. Some people are very good at balancing. Uh, difficulty with initiation, especially new skills. Stereotypical or involuntary, mo involuntary movements. Lower high muscle tone, low manual dexterity, poor handwriting. I remember I used to go into schools and you know, you'd see these kids who had you know, very good literacy skills but their handwriting was, re it was really hard for them to write. Uh, one young man I knew here in Maine, um, you know, was planning to go to college, but he said, how am I gonna take notes in college? You know, I write like a, a third grader. Um, I could identify with that. My writing is pretty bad myself. Uh, impulsivity in movements, rhythm issues, and we'll talk more about that and difficulty imitating, the difficulty imitating the movements of others. And that's a characteristic that we see very, very commonly in people uh, with an autism label. Some of the implications are early difficulties with a new task doesn't mean a person won't be able to do it or they won't become proficient in the long run. Um, people, when we see people have difficulties with changes in routine, some of that may be related to motor planning uh, when people are uh, inconsistent in their performance, that can often be the result of motor planning rather than motivation. We tend to think, you know, when a person's performance starts to go downhill, it's just a matter of motivation. It, it can be um, uh, motor issues as well. Uh, and it's really helpful often to teach a skill one step at a time, like through a task analysis. Okay. Um, we wanted to do a breakout room here. Um, can we do that? We're all set for breakout rooms when you are. Okay. So let's do that. Let's go into breakout rooms. And like you just, let's spend, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but just, uh, talk about 
how motor planning, other motor problems might make it difficult to succeed at his job? And what are some accommodations that you might come up with? Okay, so let's do that. Brian, how many breakout rooms would you like? Sorry, let's do three. Three breakout rooms it is. I will now open all the rooms. Hi, this is one of the interpreters. I believe you've put Kate Parrish in breakout room two. Her two interpreters need to be with her. And that's me, Eliza interpreter, and then ASL Beth uh, interpreter. I need to be in with her. Thank you. I saw Kate Parrish in room three originally, which is why I moved you there. One moment, I will move you back to room two. Okay, Audrey, you were right. It, it, we <laughs> we just I put it in whatever just... room you just put us in. It didn't have her in it either. So she signed room two to me. And so I thought she was in room two. So, but maybe you're right. She's actually in room three. I'm going to move you to room three. If she's not there, I'll move you to room, room one. We'll oh, find... she wasn't in one either. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Here yeah, we go. We'll try, we'll try three. <laughs> Okay, ASL interpreter, I have you assigned to room three, but I don't see you have joined. Is there any assistance I can provide?
completing front-end employment tasks such as interviews and job applications, difficulty understanding communication from coworkers, supervisors. Like, you know, like some people, you know, you know, don't just tell somebody, rattle off, do this, do this, 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 that, that. You know, write it down, especially for those of us with short-term memory. You say, rattle off a gazillion things. You're more likely, one's only going to remember one. I say, okay, what's next, Susie Q? <laughs> it's not necessary to roll out jobs because a person lacks uh, the communication skills that most people need to perform a job. Uh, we should be considering what kind of supports or accommodations the person might need to communicate more effectively, to understand the expectations and to learn new tasks. How can we communicate with them more effectively about what we're, we're asking them to do? And um, uh, in learning about uh, the workplace uh, culture. Uh, and, um, whoop, sorry. Um, and how to, how to interact with coworkers. Uh, ways to support communication. AC supported typing, otherwise often known as facilitated communication, individualized electronic communication stories, job interviews, reminders, practice, translator, receptive language support. And of course, when it comes to interviewing, you know, you know, <laughs> in an ideal world, you know, we should move away from the traditional interview format, allow people to, you know, sh you know, share us work samples. A portfolio of work samples and sell this stuff that way. Okay. We'll talk about each of these things in a little bit more detail. AAC, Augmentative Alternative Communication Tools to Compensate for Communication Limitations. We usually think of it for people who have little or no speech. Um, um, yeah. need to think about the role of the support person in AAC. And I think that's something that often that gets neglected. We a lot of situations I've seen, we have someone come in and do an assessment and say, this is what kind of AAC device you should have. Uh, this is how to use it. Um, and uh, we really need to work with the individual with ASD, the supervisors and coworkers, speech therapists, family members, and friends to determine um, what the communication priorities are. What, are the, what does the person need to communicate at work? How it might be used at school or on the job? What devices might be used? How to teach the individual to use the AAC system? And I think it's really important for coworkers and uh, direct support professionals, VR workers, others, to be familiar with the system. So if there's a new message that needs to be created, if there's something the person needs to communicate that you can change the system. Uh, and I think it's important that, uh, so that people really know how to, a lot of people know how to use the system and help the person use it. Message selection. We often don't put in small talk and people do a lot of small talk on the job. Uh, greetings people, places, and things, verbs, emotions, 
affirmation and negation. People need to be able to say yes, and people need to be able to say no. Um, storytelling. People tell stories on the job. Uh, and it'd be nice if people who had AAC systems, you know, could go into coffee break and share something with their coworkers about what they did over the weekend. And we often don't put that into uh, the AAC devices. Job specific information, procedural descriptions, content specific conversation and wrap up remarks, you know, so that people can end the conversation. Although I think about small talk and wrap up remarks, I think about um, a woman I know, Roz uh, Blackburn from England. People have called her the, the Temple Grandin of England. Very interesting person. I'll mention her later. Um, but um, she was uh, um, telling me how Temple Grandin came to England and wanted to see her. And because um, she wanted to talk to her about, you know, some of their shared experiences. And she went to her hotel room and Temple came in and didn't say hello or anything. They just sat down. And they started talking about what they wanted to talk about. And then Temple got up and left and didn't say goodbye. And Ross says they were both very happy with that. <laughs> they liked the fact that they didn't have to deal with the small talk um, uh, or, uh, you know, say goodbye or anything else. Uh, they just had, you know, they wanted to focus on what they wanted to focus on. But in a work situation, you know, we want to, you know, give the person the opportunity to engage in that kind of small talk um, just to, you know, help them become more a part of the workplace. You know, it's something that's not, doesn't come naturally for a lot of people. A translator, and we'll talk about this later as well and the role of the translator. Uh, individuals may have difficulty understanding the communication of others, even when they understand the meaning of the words. Uh, they also may not be understood by, unaware, uh, understood by others. Uh, they may be unaware of interpretations being put on the words they've spoken or miss some nonverbal responses to what they're saying. I think ideally the role of the translator should be taken by a coworker. And initially, you know, it may be a direct support professional, uh, a job coach who's doing that, but we really want to move towards the uh, situation in which um, coworkers can act as uh, translators. So this is one example. Um, a supervisor says to Ed, sweep the floor in the deli section. He doesn't look like he understands. Um, he looks confused, doesn't respond, even though this is something he's done in the past. Ed's coworker uses pictures that the previous supervisor and the employment specialist had created to show Ed where he needs to go and what to do. Okay, so the coworker knew, the new supervisor didn't, that. Um, you know, you can get Ed to make that transition if you use the right supports and accommodations and communicate in the right way with them. John um, has difficulty communicating. That he's anxious. Uh, coworkers often don't realize he's getting anxious. And sometimes things escalate into what people call a meltdown. One of his coworkers knows sign the signs that he's getting overwhelmed. He explains it's not to others, it's not good to ask John to switch tasks if he's rocking or wringing his hands. Dave's supervisor had a question about a report that was due. Uh, he asked Dave about it and Dave did not, Dave did not respond immediately. He thought was Dave was being rude and began to wonder if it was a mistake hiring. The job developer explained that Dave sometimes fails to respond because of his slow processing time with spoken language. And he suggests an accommodation. You know, the supervisor writes your questions or sends them to Dave. Mm -hmm, which gets out to things like, you know, like, you know, being able to have things, you know, slow down, you know, so many times in meetings, people talk too fast. You know, don't, you know, having visual examples, not just verbal directions is a must. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a translator, someone who takes on that role. Uh -huh, having people to... take notes during meetings. Yeah, yeah. So a translator in your case, Nicole, might be someone who says, 
we need, you know, for Nicole to participate in this meeting, you know, we need to slow down a little bit. We need to present uh, you're up. visually. You know, having cues about, okay, you're up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then next we have individualized electronic communication scripts written in first person and include a combination of caption, photos, video clips, like when it comes to doing presentations, you know, having a script written out, having it written in a way so if somebody doesn't talk too fast. Specific information on how supervisors and job coaches can modify their communication styles to facilitate workplace interactions. You know, strategies for supporting receptive language, expressive language. And, you know, also in the era of COVID-19, you know, if we look at ICI Institute Community Inclusion, you know, they've shared examples of how technology has been able to help people, essential workers, you know, be supported on the job during the beginning of this pandemic without staff always there constantly. So I, this, this is something, I think we have some references in here for this, yes. Um, and it's, it's basically people put together stories in electronic and a digital format that they can share with coworkers, they can share with a supervisor. Uh, this is how I communicate. Um, and it can really be supportive to self-determination because the person is involved themselves in creating and identifying the strategies, creating the stories uh, uh, that are being used to uh, educate coworkers and uh, uh, supervisors about how to best communicate with the person. And helping them take charge of their lives. Support for receptive language, minimize eye contact, limit verbal prompting, avoid ambiguous language, metaphors, abstract statements, figures of speech. You know, many of us in the autism world are literal. Provide lots of time to process and allow the person to respond at a later time if necessary. You know, can use you think plain of, language. Can you think of an example, Nicole, of uh, somebody using uh, abstract language or metaphors or figurative speech that was difficult for you to understand? Well, like for instance, here when you, for instance, like if we're talking about time, oh, at quarter of or quarter till, quarter past, okay, uh, what's that? Be exact. Mm -hmm. Okay, say 9.15, 9.45, half past, 9.30, whatever. Maybe don't just say, oh, quarter of, go do this. Like, say exact time. We got, you know, eye contact, you know, not forcing eye contact is often good. And of course, it's not always, some people, it's not always comfortable and easy to just focus on one thing, depending on the environment. So as, as they say here, focus, focusing on, forcing eye contact makes it harder to listen in some cases. So it's literally doing the opposite. You're asking someone to look at someone, you know, keep your eye contact with me. And uh -huh, that, that read lips. Yeah, that makes it very difficult. So some supports for receptive language provide, and Nicole, you started to address this. You provide clear and direct feedback. Don't beat around the bush, uh -huh. uh, you don't use metaphors. Don't like, like it is. Beat around the bush. Yeah. What were you going to say, Nicole? Tell it like it is. Yeah. Use multiple modes of communication, speech, writing, modeling, pictures. Allow the person to use other means of demonstrating their understanding, even when speech is possible, so that they can respond by texting to a supervisor with questions. They can email. They can use the chat function during a video call. Provide opportunities for the person to seek clarification. Again, people sometimes process. Yeah. This is you know, and focus on, okay, if you're explaining the same things, you know, okay, one thing at a time, that they, okay, you know, repeat back to me in a way, okay, so I know, okay, Susie Q, you understand X, Y, Z. You know, speak plain language, don't use acronyms, you know, if you're in a meeting, don't use NAC, da da da, da NDMC, da da da. 
speak English. And we can yeah. ask plain language benefits everybody, autistic or not, disabled or not. And we can seek clarification ourselves by asking the person to explain what they've just said or what you've just said. Job interviews, Nicole. Practice answering common questions like, why do you want this position? What prior experience do you have? What do you think you can contribute to this organization? I think it's important As to practice. Accommodations. Yeah. Again, there's the problem with generalization. So it's important to practice uh -huh. with different interviewers. Yeah. You know, allow but, people, you know, allow people to, you know, share work samples in addition to just mm -hmm. asking a gazillion questions. Sometimes that's more of an accurate of what a person can bring than having them explain, okay, so and so can do X, Y, Z. Practice the interviews in different settings as friends, family members, put together a list of difficult questions that they've heard in uh, interviews. And you know, one of the issues, and we saw this at the University of Maine, is that they have a procedure for hiring people with disabilities. And that is you first go through the hiring process. They don't wanna know if you have a disability. And then- Yeah, current hiring process in state government and places, you know, is not compatible to people with disabilities. Like an ideal, you know, I'd love to see DD councils hire people with disabilities, but because of the way the hiring process is. Yeah. Yeah. So I get at, 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 at the University of Maine, it's very difficult to get an accommodation for your job interview because they don't want to know about your disability prior to whether they're making the decision whether to hire you or not. So that's a big issue. And Mal, um, you have a yeah. comment in um, um, uh, in chat about how uh, uh, autistic social communication is a cultural competency issue. There are many cultures, uh, ethnic and religious cultures, where eye contact is not made. We never try to force people to do that. And I, that's a that's a very good point. Okay. Um, are we ahead of schedule? Can that be true? We are. Seems like you are. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> well done. Well, um, so we should make a decision about what we want to do here. Uh, would people rather, do people want to like forge ahead? Uh, or break now and aim to get out early. Why don't people say, could you let us know in chat what your preference is? Take an early lunch or uh, forge ahead into the next topic. Keep going until lunchtime. Longer lunch, keep going. Lunch now, forge ahead. <laughs> We're getting a mixture. How about if we forge ahead a little bit and then we take a longer, we take a longer lunch. So we'll go to about 10 minutes of noon uh, and then um, uh, we can. Um, uh, somebody says they have to leave at 11.45. Okay, so why don't we go to 11.45 and if uh, somebody can watch the clock um, and make sure that uh, we get off for our lunch break at 12.45 and we'll take an hour for lunch. Okay, with, with that extra 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, we want to talk, uh, um, I know it's not afternoon, but we're going to start on the afternoon topics. Interpersonal interactions. 
Nicole, do you want to read that quote? It is not that we do not work hard or have problems with being prompt, not being on time or unwilling or unwilling because we are not that at all. It is that we are not very good at dealing with people in social situations. And, you know, the literature says this, the autobiographical literature says this, difficulties with social interaction are probably the biggest obstacle to people finding and keeping employment. I think it's important to remember knowing what to do is not the same as knowing how to do it. It's the difference between what, what, knowing what to do and know how. I think the mistake that we often make around social interaction is we focus, first of all, we focus on the individual and changing the individual. How can we fix this person so that they can communicate better, so that they can interact more effectively? So that the one thing that we do, um, what's my train of thought there? Uh, knowing, so th there's knowing what to do, uh, and uh, the other thing that we do is that we focus on helping the people, people to understand what they're supposed to do in a particular situation. And we approach that from sort of a cognitive level. And we say, okay, we, and we go through lots of scenarios. What would you do in this situation? What would you do in this situation? But knowing that, knowing, you know, I'm in this situation, I'm supposed to act this way doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do it in the moment. Again, think about the writing example, uh, the activity that we did earlier. Does anybody know who this is? You can put it in chat. Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage, yes. Anybody know what he's famous for? He was a Vermont who had a rod driven through his head on the railroad when working right. on the railroad. Right, the early 1800s. Yeah, yeah. And he survived. He lost an eye. You can see through his skull, you know, went through his eye and, and through the top of his head. Um, and people were amazed that he recovered from that. Um, I think we'd be amazed today if somebody recovered from that. Uh, somebody put in... Uh, uh, um, in chat, it changed his personality, you know, frontal, uh, um, uh, frontal cortex damage. Yes, that's true. Uh, it did change his personality. And he's someone, you know, who got along, you know, he, he was, you know, fairly sociable, got along with people. After his accident, his personality really changed completely. And he just became this really miserable person and tough person to get along with. If you asked him, though, what do you do? in this particular social situation, he could tell you, he could give you the right response, but in the moment, he couldn't do it. And I think that's one of the things that we need to consider around people on, with people on the autism spectrum is that, you know, it's important to focus on the know-how, you know, how can I, how can I do, what do I need to do in this particular or how do I do it? I mean, we need to practice it rather than just saying, this is what you're supposed to do. Again, Phineas Gage knew exactly what he was supposed to do. If you ask him sort of abstractly, what do you do in this situation? He knew it, but um, uh, he couldn't put it into practice. And I think that's a problem for many people on the autism spectrum. I like to think of it as a problem with the flow of interaction, uh, being able to identify what a person should do in a given social situation isn't enough. Typically, we need to be able to respond quickly and in sync with other people in a way that makes social interaction seem to flow in an almost seamless way. People with autism struggle with this flow because of motor planning issues, because of sensory issues, you may be overwhelmed. You may be looking at somebody's eyes and that's, that in itself is overwhelming perceptual issues, timing issues, interpersonal synchrony. And I mentioned this earlier, we, uh, uh, this is really tied developmentally, um, 
to uh, successful social interaction, being able to uh, move and to interact and people with interact in sync with other people. And there's research that shows that, you know, if people who are particularly close are moving in sync with each other all the time and their social, their, their, their communication uh, is in sync. We know, and the research, it started in the 70s, forgotten about, again in the 90s and uh, this century, they've been looking at it again. It's pretty clear people on the autism spectrum tend to be out of sync with other people. Again, that's something that we don't think about a lot. Uh, there's social anxiety uh, that may make it difficult for people to interact. And there's social learning, you know, I've been focusing on knowing how versus knowing what, but people may miss the, out on certain social learning about what you do in a particular situation because of these difficulties, these things that are getting in the way of real-time communication and interaction. People with ASD can often appear disinterested in social interaction. In fact, we know that most would love to be more social. Social interaction can be exhausting at times. Just take, you know, for instance, going to a conference. With lots of people. You've been doing a lot of that recently, haven't you? What, yeah, like I went to that DPS last week, policy seminar, first in-person conference. And that yeah. became exhausting for you? Well, I can't at the end of the day when you look at, you know, the long day. Yeah. being inside. Okay, this was a study done back in 2003 at, um, at Yale. And they looked at um, where people with autism were looking when they were interacting with people. And they found that while most of us focus on people's eyes, People with autism were focusing on people's mouths. And they argued that that missing out on that sensory information, that important information that comes from, you know, seeing people's uh, facial expressions, especially their eyes, missing out on that makes it much more difficult to engage in that real time social interaction communication with other people. Brainstorm. What are some things that might get in the way of people with ASD being able to engage in successful work interaction? Call it out, write it in the chat. Wearing a mask can be difficult. Yeah, I know a number of people who really struggle with that. Yeah, right now they say, you know, with all these restrictions and having been hungered down for so long, you know, you know, more in, incivility and behavior problems are arising. And as Kate pointed out, with masks, if people are focused on people's mouths and they can't see your mouths, that just makes it even that much harder for people to communicate. Andy points out that it may be a mistake to equate ASD with being an introvert. Hannah talks about processing time, coworkers and employers giving people time to respond to questions and greetings. Yeah, and as you reference introvert, you know, I think this pandemic has exposed that we're not introverts or extroverts, we're in the middle. And there's even some people, a myth in the beginning, we heard, oh, people with autism, people with disabilities, Oh, they're used to being isolated. Oh, this is easy for them. Excuse me, <laughs> no one ain't. Shauna talked about doing two things at once, social communication and staying on task. Good point. Matt said people were um, rushing responses, processing time, as mentioned before. Uh, Audrey, trying to respond to understand social hierarchies and how those can affect turn taking. Hmm. Chain of command. Dealing with multiple supervisors. Mm 
knowing oneself and whether you're comfortable in large social situations. Mm. That the work yeah. being comfortable with. admitting mistakes, screwing up, and worry, given how much we worry about stigma, backlash, picking up on social cues. Such as an employer, or coworker is busy and can't help. Yeah, and it, someone may not communicate that directly, and people, an employer may need to learn. You know, I can't be subtle about this. I can't say I can't help. You know, I can't expect the person to interpret my facial expressions as meaning I can't help you right now. You need to be really clear. I can't do this right now. Same message being delivered by different supervisors differently. Yeah. It's important to have people on the same page. Anything else? Tone cues, right. And we may assume that a person may understand the difference in tone, but that means that may not be the case. Not using clear directions can be a really big obstacle. You know, reading body language. Yep. Yeah. So I think everybody on the job site really needs to understand, you know, this yeah. person may not assume, you may not. Uh -huh. Almost them being socially weird. People with autism have their quirks that other people may find weird. Trouble finding an appropriate time and place for engaging in social chit chat while at work. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to see an interesting video later where, uh, you'll see that the person really struggles to figure out uh, when it's appropriate to do certain things. Not speaking clearly or uh, turning away when talking. Yeah, yeah. That can lead to some, you know, really big misunderstandings. And a person may think the person's being really rude, becoming defensive and misinterpreting cues, yeah. Supporting colleagues to understand different ways individual works through anxiety. Yeah, can be coping, visual coping practices. I like that, Andy. Assume competence, but maybe don't assume that one style of communication is always effective. Again, yeah, it's person may not be able to express what they know. They may, there may be a lot more there, may have a lot more competence than they are demonstrating through typical communication. Okay, I'm gonna go on. Wait, are we on negotiating or? We're on brutal honesty. What page is that? I'm not sure. Well, people with autism are often, you know, brutal, honest. You know, we tell we're very blunt. We tell it like it is. Hmm, I often get. I'm often known as the most, you know, bluntest person in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, difficulty negotiating. Ethan was meticulous about completing his work where he cleaned a parking lot for a department store. He did he did have difficulty finishing on time when his supervisor rejected his suggestions for more efficient ways to complete the job. Ethan became very angry as a result. He lost his job. Difficulty in negotiating with supervisors have made it difficult for Ethan to maintain employment. And Ethan, it's a, a pseudonym, but he's someone I know. Uh, he, he was just very committed to doing you know, a very good job cleaning the parking lot. But uh, you know, as this story shows, he had trouble um, uh, keeping his job because he insisted it has to be done this way. And the supervisor said, no, you need more important that you finish it up and come and do these other things. And uh, he lost his job as a result of that. I have a video I wanna show related to this, but why don't we wait until after we, our lunch break and uh, I'll have that all set up and uh, we can uh, see that video. It's a very, I think it's a really uh, incredible video uh, just showing uh, a person 
uh, on the autism spectrum, uh, trying to negotiate uh, some things with his employer. Um, okay, so we will take a break. And what time is it? 11.45. 11.45, exactly when we said we would take our break. So we'll get back in one hour. Okay, that works. Okay, thanks everyone. See you um, uh, in an hour. And if it's, it's a beautiful day here in Maine, if it's still a beautiful uh, day in Vermont, I hope you get a chance to get out and uh, uh, in the warmth and the sun for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So people don't need to sign out. You can just uh, mute your camera and microphone and you see you back uh, after lunch. Years, but we've only worked together on this project recently. And uh, uh, yes, it's become very obvious how direct and honest you are. Uh, something I hadn't. Yes. Uh, yes, I hadn't I have, you know what our politics need these days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it still mud season in Vermont? I think so. They're having the nasties. People are not. I saw Facebook images last week from friends. Yeah, from I'm like, ugh. It looked pretty bad. It looked like the worst mud season ever. That's what they're saying, yeah. I'll see some nodding. Well, hopefully the weather all day will dry things out, although I think more rain is coming in. Okay, uh, I'm going to show a video from another computer. Let me see if I can get this going. And this is from a, a, a video called um, Today's Man. And it was a, a PBS video. Um, and hopefully this will work. Huh, okay. It doesn't wanna play it when it's sharing. Let me try again. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, there, do you see it now? Yes, now we're seeing it. Okay. You know, it's not moving, it's just a still photo. It's weird. Let me try again. I just love being a receptionist. So love this cat. She is my favorite. In fact, I really want to be a receptionist. We're not seeing the video, Alan. Okay. okay. I'm going to stop not, then. Sorry. You're not on screen share at this point. 
and that will be my club. If you share okay. your screen, Alan, I think we might be able to see it. Yeah, no, it's um, I was using another computer because oh. I didn't have a DVD player. Uh, let's just I'm sorry. I'll tell you what it was about. Maybe, Nicole, you and I can act it out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, let me. What are we acting out? Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, it was a video. Send it to everybody as a follow up. Uh, I can't do that because it's copyrighted. But the name of the video is uh, it's, it's really good. It's, it was developed by PBS. Um, it's a video called Today's Man. And it's about a young man with autism who, among other things, is looking for a job. And he finds a job as a receptionist which isn't something we typically think of as being, you know, uh, right up a, a person with autism's alley, but he does a great job with it. He um, um, is doing um, uh, a great job. The video shows a person coming in and he's working for a company uh, that produces shows um, in New York. Uh, and the video shows somebody coming in to do a delivery who speaks Spanish, and this young man starts speaking to him in Spanish. Um, and he's answering phones, he's doing all these incredible, he's doing an incredibly good job. But then it shows him meeting with his supervisor. And she asks him about looking at somebody else's mail. And he said, well, I thought it was okay. And she says, no, it's not okay. And he said, yes, but and you know he's giving all sorts of reasons why he thought it was all right to look at somebody's mail and finally she says no you just can't do it that's that's um that's the rule here uh and he said okay okay i understand that and then she talks to him about eating at his desk and looking at magazines at his desk and she's trying to explain to him you know it doesn't look professional and she said to him, do you think uh, if somebody walked in here, they would think you look professional uh, if you're sitting there reading Seventeen magazine? And he said, well, I think if they knew me, they would think that. <laughs> and he's explaining how he has this all thought out. I think that's something we often see uh, with people I know on the spectrum is often um, they'll think about things uh, and come up to their own conclusions about, you know, what's appropriate in this situation. So he had a lot of difficulty negotiating that. Uh, but eventually she said, you know, this is the way it is. You know, this is the rule here. And he seemed to really understand that. Okay, I'm not going to bring it up anymore. Um, it goes on, he talks about how, he talks about how there was a show and people were calling up and canceling their tickets and they were saying, they were talking about how they heard the show was really bad. And he agreed with them. He said, yes, the show is really bad. <laughs> and that's what unfortunately got him fired. It was, uh, you know, all the issues, he was having lots of issues negotiating, you know, what he could and couldn't do on the job and what was appropriate. But, um, you know, he, um, he didn't understand that, you know, he shouldn't be, you know, he can't be criticizing his employer when people call on the phone. So I'm just thinking, you know, what could be done in that situation? What, could, what kind of supports did he need to really um, succeed at that job? Supports he may or may not have been getting. A job coach, someone about being diplomatic. Oh, Nicole, that's you. Being diplomatic is a big struggle. So yeah, just, when you look at the autism world, and then of course, you know, faking certain things, the so-called social fake, Michelle Garcia winner. I think one of the things that uh, the, the supervisor did really well, and again, if you can get the video, it's really good. It's you get a lot of insights from that. Um, social thinking practice, Andy said, yeah. Um, I think the supervisor did a nice job. I think she was trying to negotiate for too long a period of time. And at some point she just should have, and she did, she said, okay, this is what the rule is. And a lot of people, you know, on the autism spectrum 
really respond well to that. But she was also, you know, acknowledging, you know, you have reasons for what you do. Um, and, you know, just discussing why those things weren't appropriate. But I think, you know, it's hard to anticipate everything. And, 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 yeah, and just in the whole mentality of always being, oh, just because I said so mentality. You know, it, when people ask why, isn't always ideal. You know, for all of you who come to the era of authoritative parenting, because I said so. <laughs> you know, that era of strict parenting, don't worry your eyes at me, the answer is because I said so. Park it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and, what I'm yeah. getting at, Alan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mel said, that Mel, generation. Mel, Mel said cultural competence training for the supervisor. Turns out there's no one right way to be a professional. Good point. Some brains would think magazine reading looks professional. Some brains would not. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So they might have been a little bit more accommodating. I think, you know, the one thing um, when we think about sometimes it's important to really state out all the rules very clearly. Um, and, you know, someone should have said to him at some point, you know, when you're talking with people on the phone, it's important to not say negative things about the organization. I know that's something that's probably hard to anticipate. But, um, um, uh, much like we're saying, you know, and go government never criticizes the president when it comes to anybody who works inside the federal government. Okay. So we talk about rules again. Um, the person in the video that you didn't see, and I apologize, uh, you know, he seemed to do well when people said, okay, you know, I understand all those things, but this is the rule. This is how we do things. So many people have difficulty deciding in real time what to do in social situations. People come to rely on rules to guide their behavior. Uh, this can be a problem when they need to act more flexibly or when they expect- uh, Go with the flow. Well, when they expect others to uh, follow the rules exactly. And that can lead to problems with your coworkers. I think of my colleague, um, Jay, who I presented with last time we did this workshop in Vermont, we were at uh, Autism Society meeting in Illinois and um, people had to sort of get funneled through these two doors in the one building to get to a location. And there were people standing in front of the door talking. And Jay looked at me and said, you know, don't these neurotypical people realize <laughs> that they shouldn't be here? That they shouldn't be standing in front of the doors like this. And I think, you know, in many cases, many people I know on the autism spectrum often are more aware consciously, cognitively of the social rules in any given situation than most of uh, the rest of us. Um, and often they, they, you know, they have to think very explicitly um, about what the rules are in this situation. When they come to rely on those rules um, uh, and things change a little bit, it can be difficult. Nicole? Are we ready? Difficulties yes. with social interaction does not mean a person must work in isolation or work in solitude even though many of us are in solitude in this pandemic era. Good job matching and appropriate supports can lead to social success in the workplace. And I think of this woman I know uh, in Maine, Deb Lipsky, very, very bright. How much social person can tolerate in terms of if, you know, depending on the environment, fast pace, you know, dealing with people. Like my sister Megan, she works in retail and she, you know, likes being in produce, being in the back not having to deal with people. But I, I, my person I know, Maine Deb Lipsky, like I said, is very intelligent, very skilled. Um, she was uh, helped to find a job. Um, and uh, people said, well, she has autism. She should be working alone. So they got her a job at a Goodwill working in the back, putting 
clothes on hangers. Well, she was incredibly bored with that. She wanted the social interaction. You know, she wanted more uh, 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 creative things to do with her life than just hang um, uh, clothes on hangers. So I think it's a mistake to think a person necessarily needs to work in isolation. Deb Lipsky, again, um, she talked about how it worked out. She worked as a kayak guide for a while. Um, and she said when she was on the water, she felt like everybody else. People looked up to me, they respected me, and they trusted me with their lives. And that felt good. It really felt good. And like if there was a crisis, like when I had my first tip over, I didn't panic because I'd trained as a guide what to do in emergencies, A, B, C, D. So when an emergency happened, it didn't freak me out because I had a script to follow. So that, you know, I mean, that really requires, uh, uh, um, that's a job you might not think of uh, a person with autism doing well at, but she did well because, you know, she had very clear instructions about what she would, should do in a particular situation. She also worked on an ambulance crew for a while, um, which again, is not something you would typically think of as being a job uh, for a person on the autism spectrum. So when we think about social interaction, I, we divide it up into three different categories of intervention. One is altering the environment. The other is providing direct supports for social interaction. And the other is intervening in the culture, which is similar to altering the environment. And altering the environment is basically, you know, making adaptations. Yeah. A person is more or less disabled based on their interactions within the environment. Integrated settings, such settings can provide good models of social interaction, working in an integrated setting alone often leads to improved social skills. Environmental modification, remove distracting stimuli, integrate the person into a new environment slowly, avoid working around people wearing minimal perfume or cologne. You know, like nowadays, you know, okay, if somebody's in an office, turn to office, you know, give that person, okay, their own space where they can close the door. Open a window, let's say, not so they can not wear a mask 24-7. Environmental modifications, limit settings near bright windows or other overstimulating, visual, reduced time in which the person might experience auditory sensitivities, use earphones to reduce noise. In the professional world, you know, you know, if it's good for the person, you know, allow them to work from home. As we look at the new normal. So in social interaction, we can provide supports for the person. We've talked a lot today about changing the environment, uh, looking at social interaction as something that exists among people rather than just as a, a single skill. But there's all you know times when we can teach social skills. And again, I would emphasize, um, let me change this. I would emphasize, um, I'm sorry, I'm having all sorts of technical problems today. Um, I would emphasize um, the person needs to learn how to perform the social skills uh, rather than just focusing on what to do. And there's a lot of programs out there where people are teaching, where people are taught, you know, this is how you should understand this situation. And this is what you should do in this situation. And people are pretty good at that for the most part, but it becomes difficult when they have to be a little bit more flexible. Um, but I think, I think it's more important when teaching social skills that you practice specific scenarios in real environments. And then you practice in different environments. So we talked about job interviews earlier. It's more helpful to a person with ASD to practice doing job interviews with a variety of interviewers than to simply teach the person, this is what you should say in a job interview. 
So again, it's important to practice the how rather than just knowing what to do. Social stories. I'm sure some of you are familiar with social stories. Um, Carol Gray developed those. Um, they can be used to teach individuals common types of social interaction on the job and how to respond to relevant cues. They can be used for, for people who don't do well with roles. Here's an example of one. Uh, and it's important to do this correctly. Um, I see lots of social stories in practice that are written really negatively. You shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. That's really not what social stories are about. Um, this one talks about, this explains a situation when people are working at a construction site, they often swear. My coworkers are comfortable if I swear when we're working at a construction site. There are some people who work in our office who are uncomfortable when people swear. So you're explaining the situation, explaining differences, our employer does not like people swearing in the office, especially when customers are present. People usually do not swear in the office. When I go to the office, I will not swear. My employer likes it when I'm careful about my language when I'm in the office. Okay. Okay. Another strategy is people can be dot specific scripts that they can use in social uh -huh. They can be used to help a person engage in small talk or to use and understand facial expressions. So like, you know, like having a script, okay, if you're gonna teach somebody how to do this, if you're doing a presentation, you know, have a written script. Sorry, Nicole, I jumped in there. Your slide. Yeah, just cue me. <laughs> Video modeling and video self-modeling. It's just a great strategy for use to use when teaching people. It can be used to teach reading nonverbal social cues, reciprocal conversations, initiating interactions, making eye contact, uh, if you consider that important in particular situations, social problem solving and self-awareness. And basically you show people videos of people doing it right. That's video modeling. And people watch those videos of people uh, engaged in uh, the correct behavior or more acceptable behavior, uh, acceptable social behavior. Video self-modeling, you make a video of the person doing it themselves. And you may have to put together clips of the, the person to um, uh, show the person a video of uh, going from start to finish in a particular sort of situation. It builds on visual strengths, positive self-review, uh, uh, uses something called video feed forward. Okay. Is there anything anybody wants to say about social issues before we go on to behavior or social interaction? Any points people would like to make or questions you have? Ask away. Don't be shy. Feel free to type in the chat. Come off mute. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, you know, because with kids, with young kids, um, I, because I, I, I learned, um, I went to a training by an autistic mental health therapist a few years ago who talked about how she learned social skills rather than be like, put yourself in the other person's perspective and like, imagine, like, that's not, that didn't make sense. It was more like, I'm a character in the movie of my life and all the other people around me are other characters. And you like collect information about how the other characters respond and you can kind of predict behavior and that feeds forward. And so like um, often with kids, it's a lot easier to say, hey, um, when someone does that thing, like say somebody does a thing that violates the like convention and you say, oh, well, that thing, when people, when some, when people do that thing, some brains 
like flip their lid. And some brands do not, some brands don't mind. Um, so just like, you should be aware that some brands are going to flip their lid. And this way you like, you're not telling the person that like the way they intuitively are is the not correct way. Cause like that's biased. Um, so, but like adults, adults, it's about not only are you like, you're, you're not only just delivering that message, but you are having to counteract the harm that has come from decades of being told that there is one correct way to do the thing. I wonder if anyone has advice for um, developing awareness of all the, from, or of all the people about like how there's not actually like a correct way to be. Because sometimes it's hard when like the example you gave of the, the, of the, of the, the movie clip with the boss who's like, well, this is how it's done. You know, there's like so many people who do that, right? But that's not a no thing. One size it's a all. brain rule, not a world rule. You know, I think, you know, it gets back to some of the things we talked about earlier. I'm working with coworkers and uh, supervisors Mm -hmm. Learning what are their quirks. Yeah. And how people communicate, how to communicate most effectively with the person. And, you know, helping people recognize that, you know, uh, making accommodations for uh, people uh, who experience neurodiversity is, you know, the, it's the same kind of thing we do with uh, to promote all kinds of diversity. Um, I feel like, oh, I'm sorry, Alan. I didn't oh, mean go to ahead. Um, I just thought I would chime in and say I think a lot of neurotypical people express that folks with ASD need to practice perspective taking. And I, I really think that that goes both ways, kind of like what you were talking about there earlier. You, mm -hmm. you know, the relational kind of skills and practice and how that, that truly is a two way street. And I think perspective taking is something that everyone involved in someone's life who has ASD could really benefit from practicing. And empathy, and then you get the whole double empathy thing you hear about. Yeah, you look at, you know, nowadays it's like, you know, where's the empathy in this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the mask doesn't just protect me, it protects you from this deadly virus. I think that's a that's a, a, a very good point. Um, you know, it does have to go both ways. And uh, when we're looking at difficulties with social interaction, we can't reduce it, you know, as we've been saying all along, to an individual's social skills or lack of social skills. It has to do with the relationship because those things, the, the way people are interacting with each other uh, emerge in real time and are characteristic of relationships. and and not necessarily a reflection of individual impairment. And Jason shared this quote from John Stuart Mill, he who knows his own side of the case knows little of that. <laughs> Good point. Okay, any other points around social interaction? We'll get in, we'll be, yes. Um, I would just like, con I would connect like workplace social skills, you have like also the, the context of things like even play, like people have grown up their whole lives being told that there's like a right way to play, like play is the pursuit of joy. And I think about all the people who like before they even get to the place of supported employment, they've had people literally tell them what they're supposed to do to pursue joy. Like if you really like stop and think about that, that's pretty messed up. So that's what we're really that's the context in which um, people are entering this conversation. You know, like work on play skills and get trained to do the play skills. That's what I mean by that. No, I just <laughs> want to add, um, <clears throat> I agree. I think we could be having more values-based discussions about helping people tease out their values, understanding which ones are in unison, which ones might be in conflict. This is a journey that all people do. And then how to 
strive toward their values, keyword their values and develop that. But that's also where motivation comes in, right? It's not just do it for me or do it because it works. It's do it for you because it falls in line with your values. But that has to be developed over time. You can't do that in one session. I think that's a good point. And I think over time with successful interaction, new, new shared values develop. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's what we need to, to allow to happen rather than just imposing, um, you know, our, um, our ideas about what uh, constitutes appropriate social interaction on, on others. Okay. And someone commented to you, Mel, I've heard great things about your office, all brains belong. So I'm interested in hearing more about that too what that organization is. Okay, behavior issues. Behavior is communication. Okay. Why do people exhibit challenge behaviors? People could just put it in chat. It's interesting because when I do this- Because they don't want to go back to the group home. You know, trauma, emotional trauma. suppression. Like I heard from somebody recently that you know, they're seeing an increase in behavioral plans because nobody wants to go back to the day program. And they're acting out. I don't want to go out. I like my, I'm fine to where I am. Don't send me to back to my pre-pandemic normal. Other stress. people are saying unmet needs, overstimulation, convey a message, stress, frustration, not being understood, involuntary limbic response to stress, trauma, medical. Understand valued, you know, value. hard nose, hard nose people, which can trigger a meltdown. Like when I was, you know, a teenager, you know, customer service bagging groceries and you know, the expectation, oh, you bag groceries and you'd be able to perfect bag it with the perfect one getting carts and greet the customers perfectly. And it's like every time, you know, and sometimes there was somebody who would complain and you know, then I would have a hard nose manager get up in my face. The lack of understanding. Uh, overstimulation, unmet needs, overstimulated, frustration with lack of being understood. Uh -huh. you know, I, I, was just, I love yeah. doing this in Vermont because the responses uh -huh. tend to be a little bit different than I hear other places. Uh -huh. People say, well, they did it because they're not getting attention or uh -huh. you know, uh, they get because it. They don't feel listened to, they don't feel heard. Yeah. So they're invisible. I, I always like asking this question uh, in Vermont. Disabled is not disposable. I have, I have a brother, by the way, with who doesn't speak, has autism, lives in Pennsylvania. And I was talking with his team re recently and they talked about how, you know, things are probably more progressive in Maine than they are in Pennsylvania. I said, yeah, that may be, but you know, you really have to go to Vermont <laughs> to see things done well. So. Now, don't forget to consider the messages. I am overwhelmed. I need help in transitioning to the next step. I cannot focus with the background noise. I need time to process what you asked me to do. I need you to present information step by step. I need you to tell me in a different way, write it. Don't just, you know, don't just rile off a gazillion things to do and expect me to remember word for word. Requiring me to look you in the eye is just too hard for me. Do any of you guys know Dave Petoniak from Montpelier originally? Yeah, Vermont rock star. <laughs> anyway, he's done some wonderful things. Uh, uh, and I know he gets to Vermont fairly often. He lives in Virginia now. But um, uh, he says the people with, whoop, I'm sorry, people with, uh, with um, challenged behavior are often missing connections with family and friends, interesting experiences, freedom to make decisions, opportunities to contribute, skills to enhance chosen lifestyle, physical well being, and safety from harm. And I know a lot of people who, especially people who have um, limited communication, often have uh, 
uh, physical issues, medical issues that they can't convey and are in pain. Uh, a person uh, like not- GI issues are commonly caused by stress. Somebody may not be able to communicate. And a friend of mine, um, who actually was from Vermont originally, he uh, doesn't speak, but uh, when he started having uh, aggressive incidents, we started taking him to the doctor and almost inevitably he had an ear infection. And it wasn't until we addressed that that we saw significant reductions. Another thing about him that I thought was really interesting, and I heard this from someone who had worked with him uh, many, many years ago when he was a kid um, in Burlington. And um, he was always someone who liked to hug people a lot. I think he liked that uh, proprioceptive feedback that he came with hugging. And when he reached puberty, people decided, again, this was quite a while ago, they decided, well, that's not appropriate anymore. And he became very aggressive and they used restraint on a regular basis to to, uh, control his behavior, which fortunately we moved away from and stopped doing. But, um, you know, in retrospect, understanding- You know, teaching people sexuality education. Yeah, yeah. About yeah. Teaching people about puberty, like, you know, with our culture eating so much fast food, people are getting puberty earlier, particularly girls. Well, in this case, I think what happened was the way people people decide, well, that behavior is inappropriate. All that hugging is inappropriate now. And he started- He's afraid, oh, up. somebody's going to, oh, say, oh, so-and-so uh, touched me too much, <laughs> much like, you know, people complain, you know, you've seen all those women claims against Joe Biden. And the, what's his face thou who shall not be named the previous president? <laughs> anyway, getting back, <laughs> taking a step back from the politics of it. Um, <laughs> um, in, in his case, I think, you know, he was throwing himself on the floor and at one point sort of demanding that people restrain him because that was his way of seeking out that physical contact that he needed. Yeah. People with autism, you know, like touch too. You know, like I like, you know, like I get massages. Like that's one thing with this pandemic, you know, the loss of touch. People don't realize how traumatizing that is. You're so true, Nicole. So true. Thanks. (laughs) I'm going to tell like it is in this universe, in this nightmare pandemic. Jen Bissett, you wrote, one of the hardest things to teach my son is with sensory craving, he is 14 now and not socially accepted with peers anymore. Yeah, yeah that's tough. He loves hugging, to be more specific. I was reflecting on that comment. Right. He just loves hugging and with the so- girls at school, it's still okay, <laughs> but the boys, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, be a Santa Claus. Yeah. So, you know, when people need things like that, what? I'm sorry, when people need things like that, you know, sometimes it's just impossible in a social social situation to provide exactly what they're looking for. But I think, you know, we have to look for alternative ways for them to get that that feedback, that sensory feedback that they need. Mm-hmm. Reassurance, you know, make them relax, calm their system. And it sounds yeah. like Karen is coming, looking at some ideas, some alternatives when she suggests grappling or wrestling, either BJJ, I'm not sure what BJJ stands for. Another person suggested dancing too. Uh, Dancing, massage therapy, yoga. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I love massage. I think with, uh, uh, when we think about behavior issues, it's important to think, you know, begin to think really broadly. And usually within the the context of a person-centered planning process. What is the behavior communicating? Yeah, what what is this communicating? And sometimes that's not all that obvious, but when we put our heads together, Uh working with- And it's like, then you've got everybody who often tends to suppress emotions. Like if somebody's stress eating with peanut butter, what are they telling you? What's going on? Are they hiding something they're afraid to tell? Stigma, especially if they're so-called high-functioning. 
Okay, so let's talk, Nicole, about intervening in the culture. Well, having a culture, you know, that's supportive, you know, teaching awareness, you know, on autism, mm -hmm. you know, clear, straightforward, positive explanations. Coworkers and supervisors may need to provide instruction on how to communicate effectively, provide clear, unambiguous, whatever that word means, directions, <laughs> feedback and social cues to employees with ASD, keep it short, sweet, simple, to the point, plain language, do not beat around the bush, you know, get to the point, you know, don't use figures of speech, explain in a calm tone what is expected in a particular situation, you know, Help somebody self-regulate, be concrete, specific. You know, your demeanor impacts, you know, rubs off on the person with AIDS. These are like, you know, if, you, if you're one of those who's da 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 always up there getting people roused, you know, it's not going to work. You're going to find the person with ASD getting that way. You know, you need well, to calm the anxiety. When I worked with my uh, former colleague who I did this presentation with last time, Jay Collins, he would often say to me, you know, he'd pull me aside and say, was that supposed to be sarcastic? You know, asking me about something somebody else said. Um, yeah, sarcasm is one thing we often struggle to understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I would, sort of, I would act as a translator in that situation and say, yes, uh -huh. that person is being You know, a social still translating, you know. Explain what something means. Like if somebody's pulling a prank. Like like April Fool's spider in your desk. <laughs> Many people with ASD may not realize what they're doing, maybe getting in the way of developing positive relationship co-workers. Co-worker feedback can go a long way towards what cues are most relevant and how they respond. You know, scripts. You know, clear, explicit expectations for X, Y, Z. Mentors act as a social translator, help the person with autism understand relationships, unwritten rules. Mentor ideally is a co is a coworker. For example, somebody like Kim Mushinel from Autism Society. Mentors can help the person achieve their dreams. And if you'll see, now, you'll see pictures. You spelled it right, wrong. I spelled it wrong? Yeah, I said bush out. It's mush now. Okay. You'll see pictures of her later. Uh -huh. Where are we now? Mentors can help the person achieve their dreams. And teaching others. Peers and coworkers and supervisors may need instruction on the following, how to initiate interaction with the person with ASD, how to provide clear feedback, about task or social interaction, you know, how to interpret unusual behavior or speech, how to teach new skills, modify the environment, encourage social participation, you know, give criticism in a way that isn't gonna trigger an energy release. I'm sure this is something that a lot of you, especially have worked in employment, know it's important to know the workplace culture, what kind of, and, that helps us know what kind of supports to provide the person. Um, it's important to know what's socially acceptable or expected in the workplace. Uh, the employment specialist often needs to assess the workplace culture. Very good source of information for that is uh, uh, from New Hampshire's David Hagner. Um, he wrote this book, Coffee Breaks and Birthday Cakes. Evaluating workplace cultures to develop natural supports for persons with disability. I would highly recommend uh, that book. Just, I want to go back. Um, Michelle asked, "What do you mean when you say trigger energy release?" Well, energy release is a nicer term instead of saying meltdown. You know, we like to refrain from using that term, like if. You know, somebody, you know, like people often, often have difficulty accepting criticism, you know, dealing with hard-nosed personalities, people who, you know, can like have that personality where they can, you know, 
only make you, you know, kind of dysregulated and spaz out and where things can become a bigger deal than what, you know, the average neurotypical would think. And Andy said, said he loved the list. He would add that whenever possible, and if the person would prefer to, it's great for the employee themselves to advocate for these things uh, on the list of uh, supports. Okay. Supporting executive functioning. Just to review for some of you are very familiar with executive functioning, but just to review quickly, it involves planning, organizing, and managing complex tasks. It involves initiating a shift, inhibiting and sustaining uh, to plan, organize, and develop strategies or rules uh, to describe these skills. Yeah, and people that are pe people often struggle with, especially those that are labeled, you know, I functioning often struggle with those girls, women. It involves uh, executive function skills also involve um, uh, knowing when and how to start or delay reactions to our environment and to shift and to sustain attention in order to prioritize our reactions. So you can see how difficulty in these areas would get in the way of organizing when you're on the job uh, um, responding, you know, in a, a, a fairly typical way to things that happen on the job. Um, and we know that people on the autism spectrum tend to have problems with these in these areas. Characteristics include a slower processing speed, confusion when you're choosing multiple options, difficulty with reciprocal behavior, difficulty generalizing information from one situation to the next, black and white thinking that limits one's ability to see subtlety or, to dis or uh, degree, a lack of a systematic approach to keeping order uh, in your daily life. Especially for people who don't get services. You know, this is even more of an issue if you're somebody with autism, intellectual disability, and you don't get any HCBS in some states. Because it, for many people, you know, many people have those exact, yeah. exact functioning issues, but don't yeah, have- right. it, Intellectual disability. Like for instance, people that are labeled high functioning autism have higher rates of mental health, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and poor and more greater adaptive functioning, executive functioning, struggle with more tasks in that area versus people who, you know, who versus those who may have mm -hmm. more severe autism, intellectual disability. It, it's in many ways, the executive functioning issues are an invisible disability. Mm -hmm. And then you add ADD, anxiety, like people, not uncommon for people to have all three diagnoses, autism, ADD, anxiety. Yeah. Having tr keeping trouble having trouble keeping track of possessions. That's me. I see too many things on here that are characteristics of me. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Start but not finish activities try to organize new information related to old tendency to have a one track mind uh, may fail to seek help if off uh, narrow focus and you know hyper focus. You know we get stuck in our ways. And that la the last one I think is really important. Uh, people need to know when to ask for help. I think all need to not feel you, stigma around it. Yeah, yeah. And I think many of us have difficulty with that at times. Especially with issues like money, budgeting is a challenge with autism. Being able to deal with abstract concepts like needs versus wants. Deal with stuff like debt. Mm -hmm. I found it encouraging yesterday at an informational interview with a client that the interviewer specifically stated the only bad question is the one you don't ask. Mm -hmm. And we had a whole conversation behind it of how there is that stigma of asking for help and how it makes you appear. Mm -hmm. And to just and have just... them start off the conversation like that was just so wonderful. 
Amen. And that gets to, you know, look at our society's attitude around welfare. You know, I have relatives that are, you know, bad mouth people and reach up food stamps who, oh, they keep having kids so they can get the tax credit. And yet they say, you know, oh, I'll, I'm not talking about, you know, oh, the disabled. I'm ta- when it comes to the poor. They're the deserving poor. Then you have the undeserving poor, which is all those low income families having kid, kid here. And do you think Nicole, oral perception Nicole, very ugly? Yes, especially in Vermont, like Orange County, Vermont, Randolph area. That area has had a history of a lot of people on welfare, food stamps. So, Nicole, do you think um, do you think there's a lot of people who have a label of high functioning autism, who many consider to be undeserving poor? Well, in the disability sense. I was, uh, but when we look at, you know, people, attitudes to people without disabilities who, you know, are on public benefits versus, you know, those in some cases, like I've seen my family, you know, they're always bashing everybody on welfare. And then my aunt, I was like, you know, oh, I'm not talking about people like you, Nicole, that pitting of one another, which, you know, hello, you don't know the circumstances, you know, people that, you know, who live in poverty are often live in the moment, whereas middle class are always future planning. And sometimes when you live in the moment, okay, you know, just get the kids fed, you know, so be it. If it's junk food, it is what it is. That's all you can afford. Besides our society, junk food is cheaper than healthy food, for example. Mel uh, commented that that she thanks us for highlighting the mental health issues. Or thanks you, Nicole, for highlighting. You're welcome. You know, as I've gotten older, people, you know, social people with autism get smarter as they've gotten older. Well, you know, like I didn't academically bloom till I, you know, left high school to my twenties, you know, be able to read at 10th, 12th grade level. Yet I, my anxiety issues have developed from twenties onward that I never had as a kid because I was so sheltered, overprotected, cuddled, and learned how rude, rude the mean and mean the real world is. I want to little, address a little bit how the rest of us often react to people who have EF difficulties, executive functioning difficulties. We tend to get frustrated with people. Mm-hmm. Especially don't use your disability. Don't use your disability as a crutch is what I hear in my family. We you often know, don't I believe see. it's neurological because the person is so intelligent. We tend to plead, believe the person's just not motivated. We just want the person to just Start taking more responsibility for being more. Grow honest. up, act like an adult, you know. Oh, you want to be treated like an adult? Oh, you know, act like it. You know, sometimes easier said than done. Sometimes it's not that easy. Is it, Nicole? Mm-hmm. Easier said than done. So, things we can do to help with EF issues providing structure and predictability. And we've heard that throughout the day, I think the need for structure and predictability for people teaching workers how to break down a task into smaller manageable parts, using declarative language instead of imperative language. And we'll explain that a little bit more. Plain language, speak English. Using visual supports. What? Don't always Uh, speak like a bureaucrat. Using visual supports, providing support for decision-making. We'll talk about each of those. Managing unpredictability, difficulty processing sensory information, the ensuring experience of chaos and confusion and the ability to accurately predict how one's body will react to move can all lead to the following. Need for stability, need for certainty, predictability, reliance on rituals. You know, look at all the unpredictability we've had to manage in this pandemic. And it's, you know, only made, you know, anxiety, mental health and stuff, you know, worse for people in the autism world, and just getting through the day, as somebody once said recently, surviving is the new thriving. I just want to, there, there have been a few comments. Um, thanks for noting uh, that things can appear as obstinance, and that's not what's intended. In the support world, Andy said there's a thin line between dignity of risk and ignoring a support person uh, need. Uh, or what they want to talk about. Um, okay. In the past, you know, quote, I used to ask the same question over and over, and I used to drive my parents crazy by doing that. I wanted to hear 
same answer over and over because I was never sure of anything. I wanted an exact answer to everything. Uncertainty used to drive me crazy. Do any of you know anyone who will keep asking the same question over and over again? Yeah, we're like, okay, did I do this right? Did I do this right? Yes, no, maybe so. You know, I've had my, times like that. My friend who I talked about before, uh, he used to live in Vermont, you know, he'll sign for the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I try to explain to his staff, okay, let's, you know, acknowledge that in some way. Let's create, you know, a way for him to visually see you know, what to expect around that. Let's create a calendar. So when he asks, you know, for a ride, you can show him we're going to go for a ride at this time, or when do I get my next Mountain Dew? And you can say, well, yeah, that's on the schedule. But they always say to me, well, he knows his schedule. I say, no, that's, that's not enough. He needs the visual schedule. You know, we like being able to see stuff. Yeah. Sean Barron, similarly, this is a wonderful book. It's getting a little old now. He and his mother wrote sort of a co-autobiography. I loved the repetition. Every time I turned a light on, I knew what would happen. When I flipped the switch, the light went on. It gave me a wonderful feeling of security because it was exactly the same each time. And I think of my brother, Bruce, who I grew up with, um, nonverbal uh, diagnosis of ASD, uh, when we were kids, he would get one end of the kitchen, turn the light on, and I would turn off, turn it off on the other side. And we would go back and forth like that. And he would just be in hysterics with that. He loved that. Structure and predictability can help people with ASD perform their jobs more effectively, can help a person remain calm and reduce anxiety and are not the same as repetitive and boring. And we talked a little bit about that earlier. We talked about Deb Lipsky. People assume, you know, she needs structure. Uh, we can't have too much variability. You know, she should hang up uh, clothes uh, in, in the back room where she's not around. Especially in this day and age. Whenever possible, help people understand what to expect. Prepare people in advance for changes in the normal routine. Support the transition from one space to another or one job to another with information about what transition will entail. Speak in plain language. Prepare people in advance if they are going to be changes in personnel, coworkers, supervisors, job coaches, employment staff, you know, bosses. Anybody's That's been in places where you have multiple turnovers. I've seen so many situations where uh, things really went badly for someone when they didn't know in advance that a coworker wouldn't be there or their normal job coach or somebody like that. Um, and it can be really difficult. Let me just catch up on a couple comments here. Uh, I know people, a lot of people need, that need reassurance. I personally find it beneficial. Uh, great article on the brain science of cognitive loops, just as motor loops. Uh, that's why the default thought stopping distraction techniques often do not work for lots of brains. Well, thank you for sharing that, um, Mel. And you shared that link as well. I would be very interested in learning more about that. Okay, there we go. Task analysis. I think most of you know what a task analysis is. Uh, it can be especially helpful um, for people who need help transitioning from one step to another or need structure in following a required sequence. Maybe incorporated in individual schedules, uh, which are great for a lot of people on the autism spectrum, uh, are not just for people perceived to have intellectual disabilities. Very simple task analysis, taking out the trash. Um, we talked earlier about declarative versus an imperative language. Let me give you an example of that. An imperative would be, we're working on some job. You need to, you say to the person, you need to get some six inch carriage bolts and nuts so we can finish this. Declarative is, we've got everything in place. Now we need something to fasten them together. Why would this second approach be preferable? 
in supporting a person with autism. Maybe not everyone, but for many people on the spectrum. Somebody wrote, it implies less pressure. No. You're explaining, someone said you're explaining why we need the hardware. It's descriptive of what's happening next. More we than you. It states what already has been done and the next step. Yeah, yeah, it builds confidence instead of dependence. And I think that's a really big one. We're asking the person to, you know, we're not person, we're not telling them, you know, now you need to do this. We're getting them to think about what the next step is. And it helps with, I think, generalization down the road. Okay, imperative is please finish your expense report. What would be the declarative version of that? Wow, Mal, I love some of the insights you provide here as, as a physician. Um, she wrote, declarative language does not evoke a limbic response, where therefore the person can actually process and respond. Yeah. And if you're just saying, you got to go do this, you know, sometimes, especially if it's not said the right way, it can be, it can lead to problems. That's really interesting that the declarative language doesn't invoke the, it doesn't evoke the limbic response. So what we, one person, give me an alternative. You can say it or put it in chat. I need your, your expense report so that I can finish what I need to do. Okay, I need my expense, I need your expense report or it's the end of I'm the month. Here. What do we do now? Okay. Or what's, what kind of, what paperwork do you need to uh, uh, submit now that it's the end of the month? Pay stubs, timesheet. Sorry, hope I'm not making anybody motion sick. <laughs> visual set, visual organizers and schedules are easy to understand, are concrete, provide predictability. They reduce anxiety, which is the big thing. Can be used to prepare a person for schedule changes or changes in routine, or changes in personnel. Look, you're going to be working with so-and-so today and should be available at all times for quick access. The first time I, we ever did a workshop on employment and uh, autism, I met Jay Collins, who I used to do this training with. And he was talking about when he works at home and he's on his computer, he says at times, it feels like there are rubber bands pulling him in different directions. You know, I need to go make a cup of coffee. I need to go do this. I need to do this. And he said he can't stay on track. He can't do what he needs to do. And again, Jay is an incredibly brilliant, articulate, skilled person. Um, but without that visual schedule in front of him saying, I need to do this and this and this. And of course, that affected the way we work together. He taught me a lot about what kind of supports uh, a coworker needs. Um, so, which especially and, applies nowadays in this era of COVID universe. I'm not sure what you meant, Andy, when you said "same J, same." Just the the feeling like you're being pulled by rubber bands and that you, you really need something visual to figure oh, out okay. what next steps yep. are. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 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 So again, you know, people often think that people who are labeled high functioning, who have a lot of good skills, don't need that visual schedule. But in fact, it can be really yeah. helpful. The word high functioning is just a term used to deny services. Trish said, I ask the people I support if they know what tools help them best. That's great. That's great. And uh, 
uh, it really gives, it really helps with the self-determination. Um, and in some cases, I think, you know, it's something that can be explored as part, part of a person-centered planning process where everybody's talking about, you know, what really works well for this person. And when the person can articulate it themselves and when we can teach people to express, you know, what their needs are, what their accommodation needs are, uh, that's really ideal. They can be used to assist a person in making choice about what job related tasks they want to accomplish first. They can help a person disengage and move on to the next task. There are people I know, I think one person in particular, who when he finishes a step at work, can't go on to the next step unless someone tells him to. We're working on that, but um, we have some ideas for that. And it can help a work, person work more independently. Again, this is what I was referring to. We often think that a person who has many skills who's done well academically doesn't need those visual supports or schedules. Um, and we assume that if a person can work independently or do well without a schedule one day, that they can do well on all days without the schedule. And I think it's important uh, to remember that's not always the case. So lots of different types of visual schedules. I'm sure you're familiar with them first, then boards, task sequences, daily schedules, calendars and appointment books, video, picture, audio prompting software or, or devices, a to-do list. This is a first then um, uh, board. Whoop. First you do the copy and then you do the shredding. This is a schedule with pictures, Janet arrives at work and it's talking, it's not only talking about what the person needs to do in terms of the job requirements, but also social requirements, get a cup of coffee, talk with Sandy and others in the main office. That's what people do in that office. Sign in on the computer, get copying and shredding assignments from Sandy, begin copying assignments, distribute mail, mailboxes, uh, and it goes throughout the day. If, if shred shredding is finished, ask Sandy for additional assignments. Um, so mm -hmm. you know, go home. Hey, the schedule has the structured routine. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. That was your slide, Nicole. Yeah. Jump in. Like, you know, and, you know, and having a to do list. You know, with task. Okay, do this, do that. Fill out timesheet. Yeah. Yeah. All that can be put into a schedule, a weekly schedule. Yeah, uh, video conferencing, schedule. checklist. You know, joining the CS shows, you know, how to join a video conference meeting, click on to Zoom, click on Zoom link, first, second, third, step-by-step -step instructions. Yeah. And this is actually used uh, by someone in my office, uh, a person on the autism spectrum who was uh, uh, organizing a lot of Zoom meetings. Calendars, appointment books, you know, nowadays, you know, using digital calendars is better. Me, I always lose stuff. You know, I'm a poor handwriter. You know, but in old school era, we have, you know, calendars, you know, date books. Me, I'm somebody who struggles also with double booking. One link you might want to check out is a company called AbleLink. They have lots of great stuff, uh, lots of technology. Um, one thing that is I find really useful, uh, and, and it's ways of keeping your day organized. Uh, or one thing that I find has a lot of potential is something called Wayfinder. Uh, it's for uh, you know people who might use uh, public uh, transportation and uses GPS and helps them. Uh, use public transportation independently. There's a lot of great technology out there. There's lots of things where you can get digital reminders. Uh, there are lots of specific uh, things with disability um, related uh, devices that have been developed. Um, and these are just a couple of examples. Um, there's stuff that does speech to text. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, there's stuff that you can put documents in to make stuff plain language. Okay, I'm just going back and looking at, uh, uh, someone said also use a phone for reminders and lists. And yes, that's, I think the next slide, uh, many of the functions uh, that- now Many of the, these functions are now available on generic smartphones or iPads, so you do not have to buy expensive disability specific products. Um, we have video modeling, video self-modeling, you know, used to teach reading nonverbal cues, reciprocal conversation, initiating interactions, making eye contact, social problem solving and awareness, build on visual strengths, support for decision making, understand all the decisions that a person might be required to make at a job, review the decision with a person, answer any questions, be clear and concrete about what the person should do, rehearse with the person, consider using video modeling or self-modeling to teach what they need to do, like, you know, what's the chain of command, who do you go for for X, Y, Z problem, and so forth. Decision, what should be my priority today? Should I check my email, enter the phone messages, pick up office mail, help with other projects? Strategy, check email to see if supervisor has high priority activities for her to complete. Supervisor will mark as urgent. Check phone messages, share info from messages with appropriate workers. If there are no high priority activities to complete, check office mail. There are high priority activities to work on, wait until after lunch, check mail. There are multiple projects to work on, ask supervisor which has the highest priority. First, second, third. And what I think is important, and this is based on the experience of someone I know, an administrative assistant, um, and you know what things she had to do each day and the decisions she needed to make and how we helped her make those decisions. Um, but if you, if you look at what is there, it's not her responsibility alone. Um, check the email to see if her supervisor has any high priority activities. So the supervisor has to make sure that she identifies those high priority activities in advance. Dan works at a part-time part -time at a farm supply store. Uh, he fills bags with seeds and I know Dan, I know his family. He weighs the seeds so that he gets the correct amount right in each bag and he puts a label on the bag he does this independently, but he has little spoken language. He uses an iPad with communication software and had to communicate with his coworkers. He's been labeled prompt dependent because he gets stuck when he finishes a bag. He'll finish a bag, he'll fill it up. He'll do exactly what he needs to do, but he needs a verbal prompt from his job coach to remind him to review his checklist and go on to the next bag of seeds. And this is true in almost everything he does at home. His mother needs to prompt him when he's done eating to get up and leave the table. Okay. So he's someone very, very prompt dependent. What are some things you could do to teach Dan to complete his job without constant prompting from the job coach? Ask him what he needs. Ask him what he needs. Okay. Someone wrote visual response, have a visual checklist. Okay. So if he has a, what well, I'm thinking about him and what might happen, he might have that visual checklist and he might need a prompt to look at it. And what if he makes a tally mark for each complete bag? Yeah. And I think he could do that. And again, I think that would be. How do I get to the next step? I would use colors. Colors, okay. Could also have him um, maybe time it. If it takes five minutes per bag, then mm -hmm. he could set an alarm on a phone or a device. And every five minutes, it'll cue a prompt. Time to go to the next bag. I think that's a great idea. That is a good idea. Yep. Yeah. 
like set the timer for like, I don't know, like seven minutes and then he'll finish the bag. And while he's thinking about what he is supposed to be doing or whatever he's thinking about, he hears the alarm and he, he knows. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. And it's a great use of technology. And it's I mean, awesome. that technology is just so pervasive these days. Yeah. I find that a lot of the individuals um, are now gravitating towards a smartphone type of assistive technology um, because of the size, the current trend, the way it's viewed. Um, people just, they're, they're more- Easy to carry. Yes, much more inclusive. They're, they they don't stand out in a crowd. They're not lugging around this big, heavy assistive technology to help them speak and place an order for lunch. Now they just can whip out their phone, hit a couple of buttons and it'll say, Hey, this is, you know, I want this grinder and this drink to go please. And they're mm-hmm. good. And they're more independent. Um, and part of the crowd, just, you're not on part reach. of the crowd. That's a good way of saying exactly right. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. And I think that's one of the advantages of all the generic technologies that are out there, like smartphones these days, people don't stand out. And if you have, we know that having a machine or computer or a telephone or an iPad tell you what to do doesn't feel like nagging as much as someone standing over you telling you, okay, it's time to go on to the next step. What I had suggested, and I don't know if they've implemented this or not, is that uh, they use video modeling. They put together pieces of video together showing him going from one step to the next step. Mm-hmm. So you know, have a clip with all these different steps in it and you put it together. So it sh- appears as though he's uh, uh, going from one step to the next. Someone, Andy mentioned using a coworker as a, as a natural support for a prompt. Yeah, that's a good idea. And to have the prompt visual in his eyesight a video prompt he can see, yeah, that would be good. Possibly even singing a song. You know how people, you you do the row, row, row your boat when you brush your teeth? Oh, yeah. Possibly a song that times well for each each task. And, you know, if this person's singing that in their head or if they have headset where they're listening to their own music and they can hear it when it ends, when that song ends, mm-hmm. go to the next bag. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great idea. I would never have thought of that. Although we do know that a lot of people respond really well to music. Uh, uh, music is relaxing. It reduces stress. Jen commented that uh, some businesses assign a mentor new, to a new hire. In one situation, the mentor, mentor was let go and uh, without um, people um, being told. And it sounds like it was a problem. Um, and that's something we will we'll talk about towards the end of the day today is just getting all systems working together. The employer, the service agencies, the family, the individual. Getting um, the right hand, knowing what the left hand is doing. Yeah, yeah. And providing the best supports possible. Um, can we take a five minute break? And we'll yeah. come back and we'll start talking about job matching. And we have some great slides of Nicole. I have an put yes, a new check out the on. resources I put in the chat from talk about supporting workers remotely in the era of COVID. Oh, okay. Thanks, yeah, Nicole. ICI of Boston has good, you know, stuff on employment support in this current pandemic universe. So um, Lynn asked if we can get links to all the things. Uh, could be sent out to the list serve. I think, Nicole, we should talk. Um, yeah, sure. We can send you copies of PowerPoints. Yeah. Well, and not, would... just the, not just the PowerPoints. It's all of these wonderful links that Nicole yeah. or other yeah, people are adding the into the chat. Resources. There's just so up, many. Uh, you know, a document that has here more resources for further learning. We have some references we asked to be sent out, um, but Nicole, you're putting up a lot more than we had talked about. I was thinking at the end of the session today, or even before the end of the session, we could put up our respective email addresses so that people can get in touch with us. Mm-hmm. Is that all right with you, Nicole? 
Yeah, go for it. You know, share my information widely. I'm open for business. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll get back together in five minutes and begin to talk about job matching. I think we're ready. Okay. Uh, I put up our email addresses. Um, Please feel free to get in contact with us. When Brian introduced us, he said I worked for the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability, Serv uh, Disability Studies uh, at the University of Maine. That's not quite true. I actually retired at the end of December. So I have lots of time to talk about these things. So feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, a couple of people commented. Um, one person said in memo section, I hit three dots at top right, copy chat, and we're able to save a f to a file. Okay. So some of the links that Nicole put up, you can save. And a couple of people talked about how um, uh, smartphones um, for some people can be a distraction, like they can be for many people in this digital age. And one person said it's important to have act to use a device that doesn't have access distractions that could have a negative effect. And that's a good point. Okay, great. Okay, and we'll put those email addresses up back up again if uh, later if you'd like. We're going to talk about job matching. Um, you know, uh, it's important to build on people's interests, even if they seem like obsessions. Temple Grandin is the best example of that. I think most people are familiar with her. Uh, she became interested in cattle handling facilities when she visited her aunt's um, ranch in Arizona and saw machines that held people or held the, the cattle in place. And she invented her own squeeze machine. I think she was still in college when she did that, uh, where she, she could get that same kind of feedback. Became interested in cattle handling facilities and is now probably the leading expert in the world on cattle handling facilities. Um, uh, someone I knew had an interest in gourmet foods, someone who didn't have a lot of uh, typical speech, communication skills weren't that good, but he like uh, uh, had a- um, He has awesome books. What's that? Awesome books. Temple Grandin has awesome books. Oh, yes, she does. She does. So this person who was interested in gourmet foods, we, we worked with him in finding him a career uh, in doing that. A lot of people are interested in computers and gaming. Uh, one person, Norman, was interested in math and numbers and got a, a pursued a career in, in uh, bookkeeping and accounting. So it's really important, important to build on those interests. Um, that's Temple Grandin standing next to one of the cattle handling facilities that she designed. Then there's Nicole LeBlanc. <laughs> yeah, now here's me. You know, I'm, I'm, a, policy about wonk. I'm like, uh -huh, a policy wonk, a political junkie. Um, I'm a <laughs> disability rights activist, advocate, state and federal level. I've been following politics since the Bill Clinton sex scandal, just to make everyone laugh. 9-11 and then the Bush election fiasco. You know, in 2019, I spoke at Bernie Sanders press conference on Medicare for all and the need for HCBS. That's Kim Mushino, me with Kim Mushino, the person who I've mentioned a lot. That's she was, she was a me. mentor of yours, wasn't uh -huh. she? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and she I did Paul Marshawn internship, Ruth Sullivan fellowship. That's me giving an award to Tom Harkin. There's me speaking at Bernie Sanders press conference. And here's me in uh, summer of 2019 getting the David Joyce Advocate of the Year Award from the Autism Society of America. So how did you build on your interests to get the kind of work that you do today? How did that uh -huh. happen? Oh. Well, I first found out, discovered the self-advocacy movement, uh, you know, Living through the shared living provider. And then I basically, you know, first started working on the you know, grant on domestic sexual violence and then started doing legislative advocacy and then slowly took off from there. 
Yes. I'm also graduated the UVM Succeed program with Howard Center Developmental Services in UVM. I have a general study certificate. I'm a graduate of Vermont Len. I've been to Iceland and Ireland as part of AAIDD delegation. And AAID stands for what, Nicole? American Association of Intellectual Developmental Disability. Okay. So you had this strong interest in politics and self-advocacy, and you worked with different people in first in Vermont uh -huh. and nationally at AUCD. Yes, I mean, you know, it's one of the places where I finally found calling in a place where I belong, where I'm not just the odd one, not always wishing to be normal, you know, given that I suck at customer service, you know, retail, you know, which is what my parents work in, <laughs> isn't cut out for me. Okay. Yeah, anything, else you want to, anything else you want to say about your career tra trajectory? That, you know, my dream job is being a lobbyist. Yeah. Yeah. I love public speaking. I love getting up in front of crowds like this. I love riling up the crowd. I love keynoting. My keynoting rate is uh, a thousand. And I've read the word if there's any conferences that, you know, you need, I can keynote. And I've seen you deliver a keynote. You know, I've done trainings on Autism 101, public benefits. Hey, thanks, Nicole. I love public speaking. And to the point where, you know, where it's like, you know, I just do it naturally. You know, I don't fear crabs anymore. No more stage fright. No more hiding behind a piece of paper. <laughs> That's true. And I've seen you. I've seen you in action. I can vouch for that. This is one young man. I, I put this up because he was part of a program that we had. Um, we were trying to find him a job and uh, we met with his family and a series of person started planning meetings, talking about what he was interested. And he liked to go on walks on a uh, trail in his town. And we thought, well, you know, people work on those trails. Maybe we could see if he likes volunteering on those trails. So his father uh, bought a bunch of bottled water that he could share with the other workers. And uh, we took him to the trail. We had all these great ideas about how this would work, but he had a different idea because the trail for him was a place where he hiked. It wasn't a place where he worked. So, you know, it's someone with a, 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 who doesn't speak. Uh, it was hard to communicate with him about exactly what he would like to do. So we were just trying different things and we failed in some things and we found that he was successful in other things like uh, uh, gardening work. Okay, again, I'm really interested in people. Um, this is another J, not the J I talked to or I talked about earlier. Um, I just like, this is someone I know very well who lived in my home, shared living for 11 years. Um, he's nonverbal, significant visual impairment, loves going for rides, helps taking garbage to the dump, loves spending time in the water and has his own hot tub in the backyard, likes pouring things from one container into another, likes a wide genre of music from rap to opera, but very particular about particular songs and what to listen to. He's obsessed, people say, with Mountain Dew. He likes to flip through magazines. He enjoys helping with cooking. If we were doing some brainstorming and we were sitting down to have a meeting, any of you have any ideas based on this description of what he likes, what he enjoys doing, what would uh, what might be a good what might be a good job to pursue for him? Working at the snack shop at a public pool where he can make drinks and ice creams and that kind of stuff and be out in a hot environment near water. That's a great idea. Building a compost business, okay? Assist with system with soda merchandising in a variety store. Working on a food truck. Okay. Local transfer station. Baking.
DJ for public radio, half of a team. Okay, yeah. He could help him pick the music. Okay, so those are some good ideas. Those are things, chemist, okay? Yeah, yeah, he likes pouring things from one thing to another. Park and rec position, yeah, yeah. He worked for a while for an agency um, delivering mail for the agency, which is something he enjoyed doing because he, he liked riding from one location to another. Landscaping for community green spaces. Okay. okay. So those are all things I'll bring to our next uh, person-centered planning meeting. Um, with ideas for th him to do. Jake, I'm okay. Is that for Jay? Okay, hold on one second. Excuse me for one second. Nicole, can you do that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Sounds Good like jobs and bad job matches for people with ASD. Generally good computer programming, graphic design, art, photography, web design, journalism, data entry, sorting, activist careers. Maybe not so good, customer service, fast-paced environment, admin assistant, salesperson, food service, air traffic controller, waitress, cashier. You know, the more social interaction, the, the, on top of, you know, personality of supervisor. You can often play a big role, like, you know, in most customer service bagging jobs, they expect to do it say hello and what have you to every person you come in contact with, you know, and they'll give you crap if you don't say, oh, hello, how are you today? Oh, have a nice day. And if you don't initiate offering, oh, I'll help you. Okay, uh, let's say you're a senior shopping. Okay, Alan cares. Oh, I'll help you and take your groceries out. That's not something, you know, many of us autism would not naturally initiate without being prompted. And I would argue that I think these, this is true in general. There's always exceptions. Remember what Stephen Shore said? If you met mm -hmm. one person, you've met one, one person. Especially with, you know, the you know, so-called, you know, high function, like the rest of uh, intellectual digital me, like, you know, uh, social and stuff like that is more challenging. Yeah. Versus I know some of you, Alex in Virginia, he, you know, he's, you know, he's stronger social adaptive functioning. Yeah. But I think of the person from the video of today's man and how much he enjoyed being um, a receptionist. And he talked about how he, much he liked being a receptionist and how that's what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. And he did a really good job of it. Now, for many people with, on the autism spectrum, that would be really difficult. And I talked about Deb Lipsky, who did, um, uh, she was a kayak guide and she worked on an ambulance crew. Uh, things you wouldn't, I think for many people would be very difficult, uh, especially people on the autism spectrum, but she was able to do. I think there's always exceptions to these things. Um, these general uh, statements we make. Uh, this is from an article on um, the search program and you can see what kinds of things people were involved in doing. Uh, again, the search program is often done in, uh, with medical centers. So there's an inordinate number of people uh, in healthcare. Hospitality and food service, getting into all the Fs that uh, Nicole talked about. Retail, distributor and manufacturer, education and government and recreation. So people are doing, you know, a fairly wide range of things. And many of them were doing it, um, people who had pretty significant um, um, disabilities or pretty limited communication skills, um, for example. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them were in part-time position but half of them were uh, in positions where they were receiving employee benefits. And this is just, you can see over time in that program, um, 
that uh, the amount of support that people needed, and this included a number of people who were considered to have, you know, very significant disabilities, um, were able to reduce the support uh, uh, to minimum um, from uh, more moderate or intensive supports. And we're able to reduce that pretty dramatically over time. Mm -hmm. Sensory issues, you know, like warning. If let's say there's going to be a fire drill, it's important to warn. And as we, as we look as we look for jobs for people, we need to think about the sensory environment, and is this going to be a good match for them? Mm -hmm. Get to know them, you know. Okay, what's a typical day like? You know, what are their hobbies? You know, some people like stimulation, some people don't. Wait, which slide are you going back to? As it's the, the sensor issues and job satisfaction. Um, people who are sensitive to environmental stimuli are often easily distracted experience discomfort in environments that are too stimulating. Um, they may not respond uh, as quickly if they if they register if their registration of sensory information is low, um, if they don't respond to, to uh, sensory in, in, uh, information adequately. Um, those who are considered sensory seeking, may need more sensory stimulation in their work environment to be happy and successful. So we need to think about all those things, both when we're looking for the job and after a person finds a job, you know, what can we, what accommodations do we need to make to address the sensory things and make sure that they're uh, more satisfied with their job. Uh, factors associated with job satisfaction, probably similar to things that are so What's yeah? Go ahead. Uh, clarity about job requirements, friendly, supportive coworkers, manager, supervisor, encouragement, support, having a supportive environment, a supportive manager. You know, I would say is the biggest factor on a personal level. Discerning commitment to the job, innovation, encouragement of variety and new approaches. And having some autonomy. Mm -hmm. Particularly nowadays, you know, workers are demanding autonomy, you know, with this hybrid work from home. Not everybody wants to rush back to normal. Especially in the disability world, you know, many people prior to the pandemic were denied work from home as an accommodation. Especially for those high risk, if they catch COVID, they'll die. So good places to work for people with ASD in general are ones where they can maintain a consistent schedule. They will use organizers to structure the job. They're direct in their communication. Um, they reduce or limit unstructured time. As many people, if they don't have something to do, uh, you know, they don't know what to do with that time. And if you, any of you get a chance to see that video, Today's Man, you'll see that, um, um, the young man in that video uh, said, well, I have some downtime. Why can't I just go home and watch TV for a while? <laughs> People had to explain to him, well, you know, that's not how this job works. Um, provide reminders and reassurances. And appreciate assistance from rehabil or, yeah, appreciate assistance from um, the organization. The, the employer appreciates any assistance they get from rehabilitation agencies. That's from, um, a uh, an article written by David Hagner, and that should be H-A-G-N-E-R, not H-A-G-E-R, and Cooney, uh, which is a great article about uh, good workplaces for people on the autism spectrum. Some other things include flexibility in implementing policies and roles, appreciation for diversity in the work workplace, acceptance of difference by supervisors and coworkers, willingness to provide accommodations, job responsibilities, resp responsibilities are consistent with the person's skills and interests. Uh, I wanna talk about um, an ecosystem approach uh, 
to job matching and job development. Um, in the ecosystem approach, you're looking at a lot of different factors that uh, can affect success um, uh, on the job. The family uh, can help with navigating supports, can help with transportation, coordination, encouragement, and helping to envision possibilities. Uh, and again, I think having, uh, looking at um, incorporating, you know, authentic person-centered planning. Mm -hmm. Getting, and having yeah. benefits counselors also come to the table and show people how work affects benefits. Yeah. So you don't get a situation where you're dealing with a $23,000 overpayment. If you get well, I, I think that gets to agencies and what they can do. They can help with navigation, act as a liaison coordination, and you mentioned, Nicole, coordination of benefits, and benefit specialists can really help with that, as you said, help you make connections and help with mentorship. We have to look at the community as a whole, housing security, health and mental health support, income security, transportation, educational support, food security, leisure opportunities, all those things can affect uh, success in the workplace and the workplace itself. Uh, the values, uh, is it a workplace that values individuals with ASD, has a supportive HR policy, um, has uh, capacity to support people in the workplace, accommodations, uh, provide associated supports within the workplace, job coaching and mentorships. So when we're looking at an ecosystem approach to job development, we need to be considering all of those things. Um, there is a program in Canada uh, based on this. Uh, it was a 12-week, 30-hour program that looked at work readiness. Um, and uh, so it worked with the individual and increasing their work readiness, but also it tried to enhance the community employer capacity for inclusive employment. And I guess I really like this program because of that uh, uh, double approach. It's not looking just at how do we change the individual and get them ready for work, but how do we create that support for them within the larger community? Uh, so it included work experience, it included experiential engagement, trying different things, uh, employer, coworker, uh, peer, knowledge building about ASD and the kind of support. Educating the public about ASD. Yeah. You know, people with autism are the solution to the workforce. Yeah. Individual goal setting, uh, training for community partners, and support for the family. And I think that's really important. This is one program. I've gotten to know Tatiana a little bit in the last year. She's the director of this program. And there's more and more of these programs like this um, that have been developed. Uh, this is SAP is a company, it's an international company with 105,000 employees. Um, uh, they have a program called Global People, Sustainability and Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, it's within their uh, HR department that promotes neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, it identified a number of individuals with ASD, other people who are considered neurodiverse, um, who had good skills but didn't necessarily have a good job history. They also have a specific autism at work program. And Tatiana says, um, SAP recognizes both neurotypicals and the neurodiverse play a major role in making SAP the number one cloud company in the world. All SAP employees add value to the company, regardless of their neurological makeup. So I think, you know, there are a lot of programs like this out there. I think, you know, we need to, in the end, we need to, make sure that there are a lot more uh, employers who uh, value uh, neurodiversity in the workplace. But uh, I mean, part of it is that they, they, they needed employees and they knew that there are a lot of people on the autism spectrum who are like technology geeks and you know, are gonna do really well in a job like this with the right support. Transition um, to employment. Yep. What are good transition outcomes? Employment and other productive activities like post-secondary education, education or training necessary to achieve one's goals, 
you know, taking Votech classes, signing up for Think College, Succeed program, and whatever else there may be out there, community living, living in the community, living in an apartment, satisfying social life, friendships, happiness. Which if anything, you know, this is, you know, this pandemic serves how we take face-to-face -face interaction for granted. Even those of us with autism and many think, oh, we used to isolate them. Oh, it's easy for you folks, huh? No, it isn't. Predictors of good outcomes, paid work while in high school, student levels of self-determination. The more self-determination one has, the better health, mental health, and employment outcomes, especially people who are their own guardian. Inclusion in general education classes. Yeah, I would say, you know, again, we talked about this earlier, paid work and self-determination are two of the strongest predictors of success. What else is important? Family involvement in the transition process, student involvement in our transition planning. In other words, if family have an expectation that somebody with a disability will have a job, you know, that often is a better predictor. Collaboration among school personnel, adult services, employers, VR staff, post-secondary post education, student focus planning, benefits planning, especially showing how work can affect benefits, work incentives like SSDI subsidy, where, you, where it makes it so the only, ha only half the earnings are count rather than the full when it comes to factoring in SGA. So if you make 1500, they only count half of that 1500, 750 or whatever. And I would say a lot of these things are really connected. Um, I think about benefits planning. I think of lots of parents who go into the transition process convinced that if their uh, daughter or son works, that they're going to lose their social security benefits and really don't understand how all that works. Um, student focused planning, again, getting all the people involved, uh, the collaboration among the various organizations uh, and providers and the family and educators is really important. Love expectations, put, being put in a vocational incentive program did not prepare me for college, did not prepare me for the real world. I did not have a formal ASD diagnosis until I was 21, no real transition, did not teach life skills or independent living skills. I'm a survivor of low expectation syndrome. I ended up going to Job Corps, which was a nightmare. Felt like living in an institution. Job Corps is a federal job training program where people get stipends for low income, disadvantaged young adults. Google it. I want to talk about a program that we had in Maine and New Hampshire um, for a number of years. Actually, two different programs. It's called Family Centered Transition Planning for Students with ASD. And the reason I wanna mention it is because I think that we tried to incorporate a lot of things that we know are associated uh, with better adult outcomes, including employment outcomes. Uh, we tried to include that into the program. I would say, especially employment outcomes. The program we had had three components. One was parent training. Uh, SPECS was the name of it or the acronym. Uh, we had person-centered planning, which was five to nine meetings, usually in the person's home. So we had lots of meetings with lots of follow-up and expectations for what people would do between meetings. And we, had, we provided people with career exploration activities. So I think we did a number of things. We, we involved the family, we tried to involve other organizations, agencies, and schools. We tried to make it very student-focused or person-centered. And we gave people lots of opportunities to experience different things and try different things. Um, what we found was that, and th these are our formal results that we published in a journal, was that people who uh, did this, and we had a control group who got the entire intervention at a later point, um, 
there were uh, significant increases in student levels of self-determination, which we know is in, associated with better employment outcomes. Students had higher expectations for the future. Parents had higher expectations and students had greater awareness of what careers uh, might be appropriate for them. This wasn't part of the formal study. This is a follow-up and we, we only followed up with, uh, we didn't follow up with everybody, just 25 people, but the results look pretty good. 68% uh, uh, were in a paid job. 28% um, were in an unpaid job, unfortunately. A lot of people uh, did, used, took advantage of some post-secondary education, 33% were in a two-year program, 16% uh, in a four-year program, 3% in a specialized program. So overall, we were pretty happy with the results of this. The parent training uh, specs, what's called specific planning encourages creative solutions. We gave people strategies and tools that they could use in the person-centered planning meetings. Uh, and we met with the families in advance of the meeting to talk about what they had learned, what they could incorporate into their own meetings. It involved lots of networking, it involved uh, teaching people about uh, adult service options and services, both in New Hampshire and in Maine, creative problem solving, creative financing, and getting to the action. So it, it was really um, a program where parents were uh, uh, learned a lot about what kind of supports are available uh, and how they could be creative in using existing services to get the kinds of things that they wanted um, uh, for their children, that their, that their children wanted in their own lives. Uh, I was just looking for a picture of families to include <laughs> on this slide. Uh, may not have been the best choice um, since their outcomes weren't all that good. But um, families in the transition to employment, it's best to include families to the maximum extent possible in planning for and for and supporting employment. And they can be invaluable. Yeah, plan early, early the yes. better. Yep, yep. And with yeah. the families. And I just, you know, when everybody's talking and people are talking about an individual, it's, it's and just exploring ideas together, you know, people come up with a lot of really creative ideas. and people, families really know the person well, and they can often anticipate what will work and what won't work and, you know, what we need to put in place to help the person succeed in a given situation. Importance of family involvement. Families usually have a good idea about what works, high family expectations can lead to successful employment. Families can help identify Effective support in advance of work. Families can help identify potential job matches. Families can help identify potential problems. Sometimes going through the family network may not always be the best, like in my case with customer service. Families can help problem solve once a person is placed in a job, like intervene as a helicopter parent when you have a hard-nosed manager <laughs> causing you to have an energy live release, start crying. Too often employment specialists fail to take advantage of the knowledge that parents may have. And then of course, you know, seeing beyond food, filth, flowers, filing. I talked about yeah, earlier about- to Become labeled essential workers during this pandemic. <laughs> And yet get paid the lowest. I talked earlier about the young man who was really into gourmet cooking. And again, a person with very limited communication. He, he drives a car now too, in addition to working. But um, he's a very interesting guy because he used to he collect cookbooks and he cooked gourmet foods for his family. So we sat down to have a person-centered planning meeting with him and his family. And uh, one of us said, where do you want to work? And he said, Burger King, McDonald's, KFC. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> Someone with your interest in cooking? You know, and we started thinking, where could he get some experience that um, 
where he could do something a little bit uh, more in line with his interests in, in really cooking good food and gourmet food. And uh, somebody said, well, he lives close to Bowdoin College and go Bowdoin College has really good food service, a, you know, nationally recognized food service program. Uh, do we know anybody? And within the group doing the planning, we, a couple of us knew people who worked there. And they, we, in between meetings, we got in touch with them. We set up a, a program uh, for him. He got an internship there. And then they were trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with this? Um, you know, how do we deal with paying? And uh, we can't have somebody just volunteer here. So they decided that they had to pay him, uh, which was great. <laughs> Uh, he got. He ended up uh, doing his uh, internship. You can see the Bowdoin College uh, cap that he's wearing. But uh, and and now he he works uh, uh, in food service, and he he loves it. He's someone else. Uh, it's just another story about him. Um, he was worried about. Um, his, he wanted to be able to drive, uh, and. Uh, his parents supported that. And uh, so they got in touch with a, a local driver ed teacher uh, and they talked with her and she explained the situation. The mother explained the situation and the driver ed teacher said, okay, well, he can take the class. And if he doesn't pass the first time, he can take it again for free. So driver education teacher was very accommodating. Uh, but the one thing they worried about was what was going to happen if he was pulled over. So they taught him a script that he could use. And the parents knew a, a state trooper uh, who actually practiced with him, practiced pulling him over uh, so that he would be prepared for that when the time came. And uh, his mother sent me a picture of him standing next to his car recently. Yeah, and of course, nowadays you got to hear people talk about things like, oh, let's have a placard saying, oh, so-and-so is autistic. This is a young man who was interested in science and uh, uh, he got a, a job uh, or he got, he did some work um, doing some testing for some oceanic, oceanographic organization or something. He did his internship. He eventually went to college, um, had a difficult first year because he didn't want to get any accommodations. Uh, recognized after the first year that he needed accommodations. Uh, he's working on a master's degree now and he works uh, uh, at a um, biological laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. Jeffrey loved maps. He attended a public private high school. Uh, he wanted to get a job at, at a supermarket. He was worried about his future his other siblings had high aspirations. This family had lots of social capital. And, uh, and social capital plays a role in often in, in whether or not somebody is going to get an XYZ job. It does. It does. I mean, his. You his, know, like I look at, you know, I have from selection movement and, you know, getting the DS system. That's how I've developed social capital. Mm -hmm. His parents um, have, um, are well-known locally in the community and around the state. I can't say what positions they have, but they're, they hold statewide office. Um, and everybody knew them. They're, uh, yeah, everybody in, in the town knew them. Everybody at the school knew the family. He wanted to go to Delorme Maps to discuss job possibilities with them because he was so focused on maps. Um, and they have, if any of you ever drive up 95 in Maine, um, they, the Delorme store had this big uh, store right by the highway with a giant globe inside of it. I think the world's largest rotating dome. But he thought he might work there, but he, he got in touch with those people after you know discussing it in some meetings and decided that really wasn't for him. He went to a college day that was held at a university campus. Um, he was arranged for a placement in a local store, even though he'd never done anything like that before. Um, he got a job at the supermarket, but didn't have enough hours. He arranged to get 
he arranged on his own to take classes at a university campus and get support. Um, he drives, he found out about another job from friends who helped him get a job. He has a rich social life and he drives to visit his brothers in law school in New York City. Um, and he, at one point he was one of the only people among his friends who had a car and drove. So he was driving a lot of people around. And I bring, I like to use this example because again, he's someone who clearly his family had a lot of social capital. He was really well known within the community. He had incredible levels of self-determination. You know, he went to this college and he said, you know, I want to go here. This is what I need. I don't necessarily want to go through the formal process, but he found somebody who could help him out. Uh, and, he, and he was quite successful. Um, I guess, you know, the question when, when I think about this, and I, I did a study where I looked at our project and the effects on IEPs. And we found there was a strong relationship between family income and whether the intervention, this transition intervention uh, had an effect on uh, your own long-term outcomes. Um, and it did, it did. And I guess, you know, the question, you know, I think we need to ask ourselves is how do we ensure that everyone, even those who don't have the kind of connections, the social capital that Jeffrey has, how do we you know, ensure that they can have the same kind of success that he did? Youth with greater self-determination, skills have better employment, independent living and post-secondary education outcomes. All youth can benefit from instruction, self-determination, opportunities to practice self-determination. And again, in the study I did, I looked at IEPs of um, 45 students <coughs> in both Maine and New Hampshire, 45 students with uh, uh, autism spectrum disorders. And only two of them had any mention of self-determination in their IEPs. Despite the fact we know that this is just so uh, strongly associated with positive outcomes. There are a lot of different curricula out there that people can use to support self uh, those Basic six, basic self-advocacy workshops, Green Mountain Self-Advocates. Mm -hmm. There's many self-advocacy curriculums out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the support, self-advocacy is, is standing up for yourself and advocating for your rights. Self-determination, I think, is part of self-advocacy. It's a little bit more specific and it really deals with um, identifying goals and figuring out how you're going to pursue those goals. Mm -hmm. Embracing coming up, with, risk. coming up with a, a specific plan. Lots of information on enhancing self-determination here, National Gateway to Self-Determination. Another example, I think, of self-determination, this was somebody from our transition project, and he was in a meeting and wasn't very active, wasn't saying much. He hated meetings. Like most of the people in our project told us that they hated meetings and didn't want to have anything to do with meetings. So we had to really work hard to make the meetings fun uh, and uh, useful to people. Anyway, at one point, someone said to him, what do you like to do? And he said, I like to break things. And I think he was being a little bit sarcastic, even though people with autism aren't supposed to have that capacity, but I think he did. Um, he was being sarcastic. He said, I like when he said, I like to break things. But um, uh, there was... There are two people facilitating the meetings, one a person on the autism spectrum, the other a parent. And they basically said, no, let's talk about that. And one of them said, can you think of any jobs where people break things? And he sat there for a while and he didn't say anything. And finally, he said, I can't think of anything, but can you think of anything? And he started pointing to each person in the room and asking wow. them to identify a job where people break things. 
Um, and I think the important thing where there wasn't so much that people were identifying possible jobs for him, but he took control of the meeting. You know, people recognized. Self-determination. You know, yeah, yeah. They said, um, you know, we respect what you have to say. We're listening to you. And when people began to listen to him, he began to talk and he began to take control uh, of the meetings. I think with... Um, Okay, um, this now is we're gonna, Now we're going to talk about assessment. Ask not what a person with ASD can do, ask what she can do with appropriate supports. Don't assume what a person can and cannot do. Yeah. And I think in, in transition, that's especially important and identifying in the transition process mm -hmm. what supports work. Mm -hmm. it's, in transition, it's time for you know, to move away from that, oh, oh, your kid's never going to amount to anything. Oh, you shouldn't walk with your class. You'll lose all your services. Oh, you should live in a group home. Like I actually, when I was in high school in this VIP program, I got paid some minimum wage. I didn't discover until, oh, 16, I go working on an ice rink. Hmm, minimum wage, 625. Hmm. Interesting. So some... Do you want to review these questions we can ask in high school, Nicole? Some important questions to answer while in high school. What are her skills? What does she need or want to learn? What can she do with appropriate support? What specific supports are effective? Job and this, coaching. And, and teachers and parents and all those people we might invite into a person-centered planning meeting to discuss these things and the person themselves really know a lot about the specific supports. And it's important in the transition process to make sure that that information gets conveyed. What are her interests? How can she learn more about her interests? What opportunities can we provide to help her learn more, more and expand about or expand on her interests. And I, I bolded this because I think this is really important. Is there technology that she could use that will help him succeed that doesn't match? It should help her succeed in school or work more independently. Um, and I, I think that's just really vital. I think uh, I talked earlier about the uh, uh, young person who talked about how his, he wrote like a, a three-year-old um, or a third grader rather. And he was worried because he wanted to go to college. And he was worried about taking notes. And um, we said, well, you should really start exploring while you're in high school, what kind of technology will help you when you're in college. And I don't think this happens very much as part of transition uh, programs. Smart pen, iPad. And, with him, we said, you know, how could you do that? And he said, well, I could practice different technologies in the classroom, but we're not allowed to use those in my high school. And we said, so how would you address that issue of it not being allowed in your high school? He said, oh, I could talk to the principal. And we said, okay. And he set up a meeting with the principal and the principal said, sure, you can, you know, take, you can try all sorts of different technologies. And he ended up choosing um, a swiping technology um, and, you know, found that very successful. Uh, I, I, the important thing was that um, um, for me is that uh, he was really involved in that himself. Again, it was an example of self-determination. You know, this is my goal. My goal is to be able to take notes when I'm in college. How am I going to do that? And he identified how he was going to do it, which was he was going to practice using technologies in college in high school. And he, you know, he really took the bull by the horns and you know went and met with the principal and said, you know, I, I need to be able to do this. I need to practice this. And it worked for him. What does she need to learn about self-determination and self-advocacy? And again, you know, those are things that often neg get neglected in transition plans and are just really vital. 
can we provide some opportunities for the person to practice self-determination and self-advocacy? And I think, you know, the example I just gave was a really good example of that, you know, where the person had that opportunity to practice those things. In what kind of environment is she most likely to be successful, happy, and content? And that's just really important. And I think, you know, something that, you know, really can only come out of an authentic person-centered planning process. What kind of social environment will best suit her? You think of other questions we need to ask? How much money do you want to make in your life? That's a good question, yeah. Do you want a new yeah. car? Do you want a big house? Yeah. yeah. Do you want, you, you know, in terms of degrees of financial independence? So let's find a, a path for you where you can realize those dreams. It's a good point. We had, we had a program we were working with students on the spectrum. We were planning to go to college. And uh, it's one of the things we did. We explored careers and, you know, how much people made, how much training you would need, uh, how much, uh, what your income might be at particular jobs part of developing, you know, career awareness and ideas about what they want to do. Yeah. They have ideas. You have transit planning, you know, moving to where do you want to live? Do you want to live in a city? You know, yeah, signing up for huge. adult services, section yeah. eight. Transportation planning, Alexis, you brought that up. Level of uh, assistance, Jolene. Uh, I think transportation is really big. Uh, especially uh, in Northern New England, if you're not living in Portland or uh, in Portsmouth or Burlington, um, the Burlington area transportation can be really uh, a big obstacle to succeeding and you need to think about that. Well, and finding the kind of supports, whether it's in secondary education in the school where mm -hmm. kids can go to get help, um, you know, for whatever managing school. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, if they're not in college, you know, do they want to have their own business? I know a lot of the kids I meet. Yeah, like for instance, you know, you know there's past plans, plan to use self-support, which is a work incentive through social security, very underutilized. It can help people support their own business. Vermont, you have IDA accounts, individual development account, match savings, you know, ABLE accounts, you know, employers can, you know, contribute to ABLE accounts. And like if somebody, if an employer, like if you know somebody, an employer oh, offering for one grade, so just they contribute to an ABLE account instead. And all the employer has to do is send, okay, a thousand or whatever over the course of the year to... Mm -hmm. Did you have something else you wanted to say, Kim? Um, I don't think I knew exactly what I wanted to say, but I, I would like to know more about ABLE accounts. Sure. Hi. I mean, you want a training? I can provide training on that. So if someone is collecting right. SSDI um, or SSI. Um, yes. And the money in there does not count against public benefits. Okay, good. Like, right. like the only thing is with SSI, once the account goes over 100,000, SSI will be suspended, but that doesn't apply to SSDI. And then once the account drops below 100,000, SSI automatically turns on like a light switch. That, if, and let's see, uh, first $16,000 a year can come from anybody. You could, if you hit the lottery, you could donate, you know, 10,000 to my ABLE account, for instance. Okay. And if you lived in Maryland here, you know, Vermont doesn't have this, but in Maryland, if you lived here and you gave, let's say, you and your husband gave, you know, 10000 you both could get individually a $2,500 tax deduction off your taxes. But some states have. Maryland doesn't have a payback provision where if you die, any money left over goes back to the feds. Maryland oh, repealed that. Oh. Uh -huh. Currently, your disability has to start before the age of 26. Right now, people are lobbying to make it 46. Okay. You know, 
and then you know that hundred thousand limit doesn't apply to SSDI. And if you're working, you know the first sixteen thousand come from wherever, and then if you have a job, you can save up to the level of poverty level for one person, and whatever that is in a particular state. Here it's like twelve thousand eight eighty on top of the sixteen thousand, which is the poverty level for one person. Mm -hmm. Well. Right now it is, or you? Yeah, to... that's what that's what it currently is. The poverty level changes every year. So, like currently, twelve thousand eight eighty is the the poverty level in this state. So on, t so when you add the sixteen thousand plus that, I could save like you know twenty eight thousand a year, and no impact on food stamps, what have you. You know, no no Medicaid saying, oh, you have too much. And when it comes to yeah. Medicaid buy-in, EID Medicaid for people who are working, people with disabilities, the asset limit is 10,000. And I believe Vermont is now 10,000 too. We you have should a couple have a benefit specialist. Yeah, there are a couple of yeah. comments yeah. In, in the you chat. You want a training on some of this stuff, you know? <laughs> Hire me, I'm open for business. There, do consulting trainings. A couple of comments in the chat related to this. Betsy Chaket, uh, you point out, um, So that's the end of our formal presentation. Questions, ask away. Wow. I thought it was a good presentation. Thanks. And somebody from UVM has posted an evaluation yeah, that was me. Um, so if people could do that before you leave, I'd appreciate it. It's a short evaluation and uh, we need that for our data collection and just to improve our training. So if you could take a few minutes to do that. Could I ask everyone, is there- Any questions, you, open up, the floor is open, ask away. Chai, can you think of like one thing that you'll take away from today, today's training, one thing that- uh, had some kind of impact on you and or on the way you might do things. Autism burnout, Lori said. That was Nicole's concept. Yeah. Uh, okay. Where's the evaluation? It's in um, the link. There's a link yeah. for it in chat. Okay. Yeah, you might have to scroll another up person, a Another person mentioned autism. Burnout. Anything else to take away from today that might affect the way you do things? Thank you, Sherry. I think it was a good reminder just to be thoughtful when you were um, collaborating with families and children of autism. Mm -hmm. And to remember and think about how you might want to communicate with um, someone ASD with ASD. Because you don't really get a lot of chances the first time you meet. I mean, you've got to make it count. It's hard to get them back for the second meeting or we had so many people in our project who said things like. I don't go to meetings. Yeah. I'll come to a meeting if you don't talk about the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll come to a meeting if you don't use the word transition. Um, so <laughs> we had a lot of obstacles and had a lot of work to do to make the meetings enjoyable for yeah. people. Yeah. I'm glad you all learned something about the term autism burnout, a term that's probably relatively new. I think the whole world must be burned out right now. Just yeah, it is. You know, that's what it. the great resignation is about is like, you know, sorry guys, we're not machines. You know, the era of paying crappy wages is over. You know, the billionaires, they've grown during this recession. It's like, you know, and with all the wealth in this country, we could literally pay everybody, you know, 33 an hour if it, CEO pay had grown with if wages had grown, CEO pay inflation would be 30 something an hour today. And probably higher with the current rate of inflation. 
I also okay. feel that it was really helpful so that I have a few um, companies that I work with that have amazing natural supports for the people that I support. And I feel like it, this training definitely helps with communicating with those natural supports on how to best support the people that I support as well. I totally agree with you, Trish. And I think something I took away in addition to that is that I would really like my entire team and everyone that is onboarded and ideally everyone that is in the lives of the people I support to get to watch this specific training. Um, this was just amazing. And I really appreciated all the resources and really, I mean, I haven't had a single training about ASD that's ever even talked about masking. Um, so I just yeah. really appreciate that. Good, I'm gonna you know, spread the world because I would love to do this training you know, national. And, and you never about hear about stuff. girls or women. Yeah, but... it is like, you know, like, you know, you know, and, and so many of us are like, you know, the people I know with autism, you know, that, you know, that are labeled cool, high five, so many of us have labels of intellectual disability you know, mild MR, that's what they call it, you know, nonverbal learning disorder. We're often medically complex. You know, GI issue, you get all of that stuff that boils up. I'd like to also say that um, I think that when promoting these types of trainings, I mean, granted, I, I was included because of the employment aspect and that's my niche. However, in our particular agency, it's the home and community supports that are providing the one-on-one -on -one supports for the individuals on the job. We provide that training, but they are overseen by um, the home and community part. And those people also should be included in these types of training so that they can glean the benefits that we are. It's hard to communicate all of this information, this was so chucker block full of stuff. Um, it's hard to convey all of that information to everyone who needs or should uh, participate in these things. I see a few other things. Uh... Thanks, Amanda. Anna talked about incorporating some of the lessons about how to have relationships with ASD people to our non-autistic students. Amanda talked about your having Nicole, your personal perspective and how valuable that was. And how it's helpful in understanding how to support people. Um, have more impact on their success. Cindy talked about gaining a better knowledge of some challenges that uh, prop up, pop up in the workplace. I learned creative tools to support employees and individuals. Another per person, Trish, uh, complimented you, Nicole, and. Uh, that she learned a lot from hearing you. Can you say the question over? Can you say what you just said over again? Oh, okay. The question was, um, it, what, what are you gonna take away from today? Is there anything that you would take away from today? Well, like I said, it was a really good training. Um, I guess, you know what, my real issue is uh, school special needs programs. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. I think one thing to think about with that is Dis disability programs, you know, like, you know, there's a movement away from the term special needs. Well, Just, maybe I used the wrong word. I'm sorry. Um, services for people with disabilities. That's what I want to say. That, yeah, that's good. 
I think one place to address that is really in the transition plan. I'm really asking for things like, you know, what's the plan for self-determination? How are we going to increase self-determination skills? And you know, there are probably lots of schools that are doing well with that. But if they're not, you know, you can say, look, there are all these curricula out there. And, you know, I can share those with you. We listed those here in the presentation. Um, we talked about questions you can ask or that should be asked and tried to answer during the transition process. So I think, you know, to the extent that we can, we can work with schools, provide them with information, ask them to answer right. some of Collaboration them. is what we want, right? Yeah. Collaboration. Yeah, yeah. And maybe doing it in a way where you're, you know, not just, um, uh, you know, you may be frustrated with a particular school district or a particular school around some things, but, you know, we can also uh, make it kind of positive by, you know, just, you know, these are some things I learned. Can we, you know, incorporate this? Um, yeah, I haven't worked in schools in a while, um, so probably a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. I see. Who is that? Karen, you're shaking your head. I've been out of schools for about two years, and I really did not see a whole lot of positive movement, at least in the school systems I was in. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty sad how teachers were looking. I worked as an occupational therapy assistant and teachers were looking for somehow to cure the student, uh, for me to cure the student as opposed to supporting them in the way they needed to be supported so they could be successful. Yeah. And I couldn't get any backup from administration. So I was happy to jump over to what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Medical like model I'm needs to end. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get in the position of bashing schools because I'm I don't either. Former, I'm sure there's some good ones out there. I'm right? a former teacher myself, and uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of good things going on. Right. And even if we have, you know, even if we're grumpy about some things, <laughs> they'd work yeah. hard. Yeah. 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 I'm looking at the notes. Um, People talk about how much they've learned from you, Nicole, uh, gain better knowledge of some challenges. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, I never realized how little self-determination was considered as a goal. Uh, the information on communication, how to communicate at work, uh, high stimulus environments. Um, Matt, you talked about using plain terms, no metaphors. Uh, worked in school for 12 years and I rarely saw inclusion. Really, Vermont is the home of inclusion. Uh, I'm so glad some of you are gonna start using plain language after today's training. And Alan, one uh, note I just wanted to make about Vermont because I love Vermont so much, I'm gonna be here forever. Hopefully if I can afford to live here, um, is just that, uh, Oh, you know, a lot of folks are moving to Vermont and beginning to work in human and social services. Um, so there are a lot of people that are coming here that don't have either the upbringing or the, the background that, you know, I might have had growing up here when it comes to uh, folks with disabilities and kind of how to treat them as full human beings. Um, so I think there there is some interesting, uh, like, backsliding happening, at least anecdotally from what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this pandemic has definitely exposed, you know, the ableism and the racism in our society. Like, you know, I know right now in Vermont, you know, there's people that are talking about being tired of just shared living residential models. Like down here, you know, whereas the rest of the world is, the country has group homes institutions that we're trying to get rid of. Down here, they just started, you know, they have Maryland inclusive housing, which is a nonprofit board that I'm on. And then there's Main Street Housing, which is a, you know, an apartment complex where you have X percent people with disabilities, X percent those without. You know, Alan and Nicole. Build more supportive housing programs. Sorry, Nicole. I have a question for both of you. 
Um, sure. A little more a broader question, but uh, you're both on different kind of ends of your career, right? Alan just retired and Nicole, as long as I've known you, you've been hustling and building this career. Yeah, and trying to find, you know, full-time job. Keep you know, at I'm, it. Right now, I'm pretty much been in the gig economy, bouncing here, there, part-time there. So I'm curious, um, you know, what you feel, this is a broad, when I say like the field, it's broad, it's transition, it's employment, it's independent living, it's, it's like in the most broad sense, what do you feel is really important right now? And where do you see us going in the next generation? You know, in Vermont, we're almost 30 years from Brandon closing. We've got like a, a generation almost from then kind of in the work scope of things. So, so what's next? Well, in the new normal, uh, we need to, our service system needs to move from being per, system centered to person centered. No more of this, what's in the best interest of the system, what's in the best interest of the person, move towards embracing dignity of risk, particularly, you know, having this conversation with parents, you know, supporting people with disabilities and to move out of the parents, not just go bread and breakfast, shared living providers, something people are complaining about in Vermont, whereas the rest of the world that's complaining about group homes, institutions, as far as self-advocates are concerned, you know, developing peer mentoring, developing models, you know, where people can, you know, own their own businesses, where people can, you know, you know getting, you know, more... People just, you know, work from home jobs as an option, not just food filled, given that, you know, the pandemic has shown, you know, many jobs can be done from home. You know, many people with disabilities were denied work from home as an accommodation before the pandemic, especially those that are immunocompromised. And right now, you know, if you go on Twitter, the immunocompromised folks are screaming, you know, with the CDC getting rid of mask mandates and everybody talking about living with COVID, COVID's over, it's like, you know, and yet it's still causing damaging waves from here to there, long COVID, the mass disabling of that. For me, so, I, I think we're moving, I'm hoping we're moving from a field that has focused almost exclusively on fixing people, a medical model, uh, to looking at how we provide the right supports for people, recognizing that uh, social interaction isn't the sum of the interactions of two people, but it exists as a, as a system in itself, and that we need to look at those systems. Those mm -hmm. systems. And get rid of all the silos. You know, we need and, to stop and, having stigma around mental health. You know, no more of this hush hush. We don't talk about that. Somebody know, who suffered I, a panic I was, attack I was at the beginning of this pandemic. <laughs> Everything's a system, everything, family systems, yeah. human service systems. Yeah, and we need to break down stigma, ableism. You know, we need to, you know, like stop with putting the high functioning, you know, mild, not disabled versus, you know, severely autistic and what have you. Stop it with all those fights. Everybody can live in the community regardless of severity of disability with the right supports. You I know, feel people like are safer the in the community, better health, better health Sorry, outcomes, you know, self-direction, you know, is the wave of the future. I feel like the terminology needs to change, too. We've been changing with the times, especially here in Vermont, but I feel like the terminology for different, what they call disabilities, needs to be changed. It's not that. It's all abilities. Everybody has abilities. So it should be classified as an ability, not a disability. Uh, diversity, neurodiversity, you know. And if we all live long enough, we'll all join the disability club. Look at all these long haulers. You know, COVID is like the first mass disabling event since polio. You know, from the 50s, 30s, and the 50s, you had the, you know, polio vaccination. While at the same time, you had uh, Asian flu pandemic under Eisenhower. You know, pandemics yeah. are mass disabling events. Can I, can I get back to the point I was making, which is I, I think that, um, again, we need to look at, uh, when we look at social interaction, we need to be, when we look at communication, we need to be looking at relationships and, you know, recognize that uh, social interaction, communication, all of that occurs within relationships and that we need to focus on Relationships are what make people happy, not yeah. just the work. And we, we need, need to, to build relationships in our communities. Right. Is what you are saying. 
Yeah, so rather than just mm -hmm. you know, focus We are on, a solution to the workforce shortage. So rather than focusing on just uh, the individual skills that we uh, look at it more broadly, that those skills occur within certain contexts and we have to uh, look at those mm. contexts. And you know, people talk about how, you know, hiring people just sort of boost morale. You know, freely given relationships, you know, social world valorization, social capital, we need to boost that. Which will help combat the loneliness pandemic and the and mental health pandemic. You know, peer mentoring agencies like Washington County Mental Health should be hiring self-advocates to, you know, to teach independent living skills, help people live on their own, live in apartments, you know, hiring people with disabilities, provide mental health support, something that's only going to increase as we head into the new normal, whatever that looks like. You know, you know, the time, the time now, you know, to figure out, okay, what does the world look like when we get on this is now, not when after the crisis is over. Right, drive you know, the ship, don't to, let it drive you. Uh huh. Return to normal is not an option if it excludes disability. We are not disposable. And we don't need to be cured or fixed. World, World Health Organization says a person is more or less disabled based on their interaction within the environment. Well, um, if there's nothing else really uh, people have to say or ask, uh, it looks like we can end a little bit early today if people are all right with that. Yeah, well, I want to really thank Alan and Nicole for all the time you took in preparing for this presentation and um, the awesome presentation you gave. And I want to thank the participants uh, for showing up and, um, and your activity as well. Um, I did post a link. We do have another training coming up. Alan and Nicole, you were talking about um, cell phones and mobile technology. We have um, mobile technologies as vocational support coming up um, May 3rd and Lake Maury, that's going to be an in-person training because it's a lot of hands-on um, work. It's with uh, uh, Tony Gentry from uh, VCU, so he'll be coming up. Um, I'll send this out on the email as well, um, and I'll gather, I'll work with Nicole and uh, Alan to, to gather the, the links that you put in the chat, um, and we'll pull together a, kind of a packet we can send out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Feel free to post, you know, stuff to the website, all the links. You know, and, you know, if you want, if you, if you ever have any, you know, more speaking engagements, I'm open for business. I'm doing a keynoting, like doing a keynote on Wyoming uh, in June. And then I'm presenting at the Anchor Conference next week. Tony Gentry is great. That should be a great, uh, that should be a great workshop. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. I think it's uh, the timing's good on it. Yeah, we haven't done a lot, I think, in Vermont with no mobile technologies. And now with the staff shortage and things like that, the more technology and remote stuff we can provide, I think the better. Mm -hmm. And if you look at ICI, check out ICI Boston, UMass Boston Institute of Community Inclusion, David Huff, who works there. You know, they have a bunch of stuff on COVID and, you know, supporting, you know, workers during COVID using remote technology. You know, where the job coach used to always come face to face, but then they started figuring out a way to do it using technology. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. There's still some sunlight. Go out, enjoy some of the day. And uh, oh, send again. the sunshine to DC. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks again.